Welcome to Orthodox Christian Theology. This is Craig Trulia, and with me today is the one and only Father John Whiteford. How are we doing, Father? I'm doing good. Thank you. It's great to be here with you because without you, this show would not be taking place. I was not planning on doing a video response to the documentary, um, The Failure of Eastern Orthodoxy. And you uh, shot an email and wanted to do a show and talk about it. And I thought, well, the only way I'd do the show would be is with Father John. And so here we are today. And I want to be able to unpack this film with you, get your view on it. So like, Father, let me just give you an opportunity to just tell us what your overall view of the film is, its merits, its demerits. <clears throat> and, uh, and then as we do in all these, we'll then just chronologically go through it. Well, you know, as, as you commented, I think the production quality was pretty good. There were some odd things about the way they, they went about it. For example, I, I thought it was strange that in a movie that's trying to, or in a, in a documentary that's trying to address why Eastern Orthodoxy is wrong, like within the first couple of minutes of the video, they take an excerpt from you know, a highly controversial sermon by Patriarch Kirill, as if this is representative of what everybody thinks. And, you know, I, I wrote an article explaining how you can understand what Patriarch Kirill was saying in a way that isn't heretical, but it's not like his, his sermon was greeted with universal acclaim or anything like that. But I think the reason why they did it was because we're living in a, at, at a time when there's a lot of anti-Russian sentiment and uh, you, you, a lot of people are pro-Ukraine and anti-Russian, and they have a, a you know not a very deep knowledge of what's really been going on. And so this is a way of sort of poisoning the well about orthodoxy right off the top, and um, and getting into it. You know, the the, the thing is, n nobody would say that what what patriarch. No one would say the Orthodox Church believes that fight, dying in battle washes away your sins in the sense that Christ died for us on the cross. And and I think that, like I said, I wrote an article explaining, I think what he was trying to say was, is not that it washes away your sins in any sense that it earned your salvation or it provides the basis for your salvation. But in orthodoxy, there is this idea that you're supposed to bear the fruits of repentance for you to, to be prepared to enter into the presence of God when you die and when we speak of the martyrs, we talk about how martyrdom washes away sins, but we also don't mean that in the sense that it, it, it substitutes for Christ's blood on the cross. It means that that's the prime example of someone who's born the full fruits of repentance, someone who's willing to die for Christ. And uh, and thing is, you can argue with whether it was wise for Patriarch Kirill to make the comparison with soldiers who die in battle because they are dying for their love for their families, love for their country. Uh, but he wasn't saying what most people tried to make it out to be, that just going to Ukraine and killing Ukrainians was going to earn It's like salvation. an indulgence. Right. right? It's it, like an indulgence. It, it, <laughs> he, he was saying that if you, if, if you meet certain criteria, you're going there because you're doing it out of lo love and loyalty, and you, and you sacrifice yourself for those reasons, that this is a, a, a sacrifice that... Is, is an example of bearing the fruits of repentance. But uh, the church has never put soldiers dying in battle on the same level as the martyrs just because it's, with martyrs, it's pretty clear why they died. <laughs> and and uh, with soldiers, they may have died sacrificing themselves for their friends, their family, and their country and doing it in a noble Christian way. But it's a lot harder to really tell that. And uh, so anyway... He, they get into this issue right off the bat as if this is indicative of what Orthodox people believe. And it's just really, I think, dishonest for them to have done that. Um, well, it's thing one thing I want to do to at least justify the filmmaker on two ends. Like one, of course, this is polemic. So they're not going to put the most positive spin right. on the people they uh, disagree with. Let's just, you know, be honest about that. No one generally does. Um, I do think those who want a more critical um, apologetic would want to see someone 
attack the best the other side has the offer to offer, not the worst, right? That would be right. the, the chivalrous thing to do, perhaps. But I do think that unlike, let's say, Protestantism, where no offense to Protestants, they're pretty comfortable with being wrong, right? They generally change which Protestant denomination they are a few times. Uh, they will see that, well, all these other Protestants, which they view on the same side, are yet uh, have all these different doctrines. They don't really have this infallible view of themselves, but the Orthodox and the Roman Catholics have a view of their own infallibility, and so of the of the whole church, not of the of whole the church, of yeah. course. But you have to think of how this appears to an outsider that they're making a bigger claim, and so then when they see an error, it's a bigger deal. Now, of course, right? Like no one says the any given patriarch's infallible. Even the Roman Catholics will say that everything the Pope the Pope went and made a statement like that it technically wouldn't meet their uh, criteria for infallibility. But that's what the optics. are are to them. So even without being disingenuous, one could simply just be not charitable and just have the overall view that, well, they view what they are bishops say as infallible. So this is a big deal. But I, I do agree. I thought, as the kids would say, it was a little cringeworthy because most people don't, most other patriarchates disagreed with the sediment, which shows that this is not what the church believes or, or even is sympathetic to. And on top of that, Rokor wasn't in favor of it. The OCA wasn't in favor of it. They're within the Russian church. I won't get into details, but people within the Moscow patriarchate I know weren't in favor of it, right? So it's right. it doesn't like, yes, that's what the Bishop of Moscow said, but there's many other bishops within the Moscow patriarchate and there's many other patriarchates other than Moscow. So it's it's just one of those statements that, yeah, it's kind of embarrassing, but it's I think we sort of deserve it because the same reason why when we criticize clown masses and Roman Catholicism or the Pentecostals and the people hitting the floor and the silly over-the-top antics with the Protestantism, those are kind of slanders against, let's say, a whole ideology when in reality they're just speaking for that one wacko, right? So that's why, let's say, when we have done shows, um, we tend not to focus on clown mass apologetics, as I like to call it. It's like, oh, just judge them by their worst. Find the one crazy thing someone did at some point and say, well, that's what all this leads to. So um, that, that's to add the nuance to that. Um, but I think it's good you brought it up because you. I think a lot of the film – whether by intent or not intentionally, I'd like to think not intentionally because unlike uh, Pastor Joshua Shooping, it's not like he's Orthodox, not like he's been educated, had a parish, etc. that there's just a lot of these misnomers that just don't make any sense from the inside from our perspective. Like maybe they can make sense if you're someone genuinely looking into it and just don't have a positive view, but they just don't make sense from – I would say my perspective or your perspective. I don't know if there's anything you'd like to add to that. Well, the thing is, I think there is a big difference between the clown mass issue because the thing is, if we're talking about, uh, you know, an isolated incident where a priest gets slapped down because he does something stupid liturgically, we have some stuff like that that happens once in a while in the Orthodox Church, but it doesn't. It's not something that's winked at. But when you've got clown masses going on all the time and the bishops don't do anything about it, at some point you have to assume, well, this is not a, a an anomaly. This is something that is tolerated. Uh, in the case of Patriarch Kirill, you know, he was given a sermon and I, you know, I don't know if he had a text and he was reading off a teleprompter. I, I, I thought that it was in the context of a service. I'm assuming he didn't have a teleprompter. And I know that sometimes people, I, I just know from my own sermon, sometimes I intend to say things in a sermon, but because I'm, you know, not, I don't want to sit there and read a text dryly. Uh, I wind, and, you know, and also sometimes you think you said something a certain way, and then when you hear a recording of it, you later say, well, did I say that? I, I can't believe I put it that way. Uh, and unlike a written text, you can't go back and edit it. Uh, so it's it, it makes it... Uh, it, it's a little harder to edit, but 
what I think I I know what he was trying to say, and I think it it's okay to criticize that maybe he didn't do a good job of saying what he wanted to say. But I don't think that what he was trying to say was heretical. But I, the thing is, the guy who did this documentary seems to be aware enough about what's going on in Orthodoxy that you would think that he he would have known and probably did know that that sermon didn't go over very well. <laughs> And, and and so to present this as well, here's a representative comment from orthodoxy. That's why I would say that it's either dishonest or it's it shows some really sloppy homework. And I I tend to think it's probably the latter. But you know, if I'd be if the guy told me that he just didn't know, I I wouldn't say that he was a liar. Uh, another thing, I thought it was kind of strange that when he has Christ and the apostles speaking, that they're always speaking with an American accent or maybe a British accent. But then when the, uh, the saints of the church are speaking, they have these really thick uh, accents. Sometimes they sound more like Spanish Castilian accents than they do Greek or, uh, or Russian accents. It's kind of strange, the choices that they've made for the, the, the people who read these things. And also when the Virgin Mary is, is being quoted, she's got this foreign accent. And you kind of have to wonder, wh what was their thinking there? Are they trying to other uh, the, the Orthodox, make it obvious that, well, these people are furners, but, uh, but here are the saints and the apostles, they're on our sides, so they speak American. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it's, just, it, it's just strange that, that yeah. they, they would have made choices like that. It's kind of like in Star Wars, the Empire has British accents and the Rebellion is an American, right? right? So that way it's like the civil, the revolution. And in Gangs of New York, the right is supposed to root for the Irish. Um, they all have American accents and then the Americans have British accents. <laughs> yep. um, I presume I could be wrong. Um, it, it, it's something that would be interesting to unpack. I'm going to guess he was using AI voices. Right, I don't think those were people reading. I think that was maybe these days with AI voices, and because uh, yeah, it would sound like the church fathers had French accents, and but like they're not from France, and it was. Um, but I guess it was he felt that worked better than, let's say, him just reading it with his voice, or something like that. Um, but yeah, right. it's, it it could have been a less than perfect choice, an otherwise well put together film. You must be higher tech than I, because I, I wouldn't have thought that that kind of technology would be that easily accessible can come off sounding like a, a, a natural human voice. But F maybe, Father, maybe so. you're joking, right? You're Mr. Computer. That stuff's mainstream now. Well, I, I used to be high tech and, you know, back <laughs> in the day, but I, I used to think it was funny that my mother was would always call me up and I had the hardest time talking her through a computer problem. And now with some of this modern uh, gadgetry, I have to call my my daughter up and ask her to, <laughs> to, to to figure it out for me. So I, I guess it all it all comes around at some point. We all become old geezers. Uh, you're just getting too busy. You're you're <laughs> you're getting too many converts at your church. So I wanted to maybe say this because the premise is I think everything. Now I could be wrong, but here's my impression watching the film, which is the whole thesis. Essentially, is unless the doctrine is pre Nicaea, you know, it's it's irrelevant. And so, kind of like the working conspiracy theory sort of is, it's never explained exactly how Theodosius or Constantine did this, but it's sort of like anything after Constantine, the church is just too corrupt and too many bad things. And somehow it's connected to Roman policy, uh, which I just think the overall thesis just lacks a basis in the written evidence. Like there's, we don't have any, anything from, you know, Constantine and Theodosius where they're requiring asceticism and, and some of the things that are, uh, or Marian doctrine, some things that are disputed um, in this film, but it, it's a thesis that's just so popular. It's like in the Da Vinci code and, and everything. So just sort of people, will take it more seriously, but it's not something you could actually seriously argue like an academic setting or something like that. But that's why I think in a lot of my own personal apologetics, I've always focused on pre-Nicene evidence for Orthodox doctrines because it's just taken for granted if it's in the fourth century, it's bad. But something I said in my own review of the film is that 
the Christian religion becomes incomprehensible. Like if we're just going to just discount almost all of the fourth century evidence to starting there, because our earliest copies of the scriptures are from the fourth century. So if the Christian religion is already apostate by the fourth century, then on what basis their religious documents have any, you know, any relevance to us? It, it seems to me very bizarre. I always felt that we, at least the earlier reformers, like in the 1500s, actually argued that the early church was what they were. I mean, they were wrong, but like, the, let's say Calvin would say, yes, St. Ambrose and St. Augustine, they agreed with us. You know, it's, of course, it's completely incorrect, but at least it's ideologically more consistent that, yeah, the early church was us. But we sort of moved to, and I think it might be an American thing, because early Protestantism had just as much state apparatus as manipulating things as the Roman Catholic Church did. Um, and so, like, now we've moved to, well, the government's involved is bad. I'm not saying it's good, by the way. I'm not trying to defend it, but that it just automatically invalidates anything theological. And this would have been something pretty alien to the early Reformation where Luther had bishops chosen by the German princes and Calvin was essentially the despot of his city. And, you know, like, you know, Anglican Church is the, you know, state church of England. So, like, it's the, it's kind of this critique that would have made no sense in the early Reformation, and I and I believe this critique is, has shown that Protestant apologetics has shifted the goalposts as the early sources and and valid historical inferences from these sources have just moved so steadily against the most early Protestant um, arguments, and kind of shows that the basis of Protestantism is faulty. Um, but that being said, I do think it's worth bringing out this is the basis of the film so we can understand the critiques that it makes. Um, I don't know if you have anything on um, that topic to bring up about it. Well, that's definitely, I mean, and th I agree with you in terms of apologetics that you, if you're, if you're trying to convince Protestants, you have to show them stuff that's pre-Nicene uh, because otherwise they're going to dismiss it as well. That's a later Catholic corruption. Now, it is interesting that when it comes to certain church fathers like St. Augustine, St. Athanasius the Great, St. Basil the Great, that, uh, that uh, this guy tried to claim those guys. And they'll take, you know, some quote cherry picket, like St. Athanasius affirming scripture uh, as if he never said stuff about tradition you know when when he was uh, he, he was a deacon at the time of the council of nicaea and in all the times that he was being persecuted uh, for standing for nicaea he constantly referred back to that council as being authoritative so he, he wasn't just saying look it's there clearly in the bible and that was all he ever had to say and so to take you know in isolation some quote where he's saying scripture is sufficient to make this point as if he didn't say anything about tradition is just not really being honest. And uh, St. Athanasius the Great wrote the life of St. Anthony the Great. Yep. And, and so we have some issue to, with St. Anthony. <laughs> and so if, yeah. you're, if you're trying to say that uh, all this ascetic stuff is this later corruption, uh, which is a big point that they tried to make, well, here's your hero, St. Athanasius the Great, and in the midst of all his trials and tribulations in his life, one of the great works th that he produced was a thorough life of St. Anthony the Great. And, uh, and then another one of this guy's heroes, St. Augustine, you know why he, he, he decided to become a monk? He read that life of St. Anthony the Great from St. Athanasius the Great and decided he wanted to become a monk. So when you try to act like, well, those things are just later corruptions, uh, but, but, you know, St. Athanasius the Great, St. Augustine, those guys were like us. It's just nonsense. St. Augustine, you know, if you're talking about purely uh, some, some, some aspects of Calvinism or some of Martin Luther's idea, like the bondage of the will, that sort of thing, you do find some stuff in the, uh, uh, in the St. Uh, Augustine uh, controversy with Pelagius that gives you some support. But there's so, so much in St. Augustine that doesn't support it. Like his own life, you know, when he gives his, his uh, confessions, um, he, his mother is the hero, really, of the story, if you want to know the truth. 
uh, you know, she's the one that that kept praying for him while he got away from God, and he has nothing but the mo- utmost admiration for his mother. And when she was was dying, he he recounts tenderly her last wish that he would remember her at the altar of the Lord after she died. And he doesn't say, and then I told her, you know, you, you misunderstand the gospel, my dear woman, because uh, we're saved by grace through faith alone. And, and, uh, and uh, so therefore, uh, you know, prayers for the dead don't do any good. So I, you know, I, you know, you need to get right with God before it's too late. You know, there was nothing like that said. He had no such view. And uh, and Saint Basil the Great, he, he he he's the guy who 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 clearly defined the role of tradition more clearly than any father of his of his age. It, it, we, one of the ecumenical canons that we uh, have have affirmed in the ecumenical councils that come from Saint Basil is taken from his treatise on the Holy Spirit, where he talks about how how tradition is as authoritative as Scripture. Uh, because he was responding to people who were responding to an argument that he had made that, look, when we say the doxology, glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, we're obviously putting the Holy Spirit on the same level as the Father and the Son. So therefore, the idea that the Holy Spirit's not a person can't be true. And the response that he got from these people who were semi-Arians or Arians that were denying the, the Holy Spirit's person, personality was, well, that's not in the Bible. And what did he say? Well, sure, it's in the Bible. Let me show you. And then go back and forth arguing from Scripture. No, what he said was, is, look, the, the doxology is not in the Scriptures, but there's lots of things that we all accept as absolutely true that are not in the Scripture. And he goes down and he gives a list. And actually, the list that he gives is very similar to an earlier list that Tertullian gave in a similar argument that he made from on the basis of tradition and, and Tertullian's pre-Nicene. So uh, St. Basil didn't come up with this out of thin air. So it's just, it's really, it's, it's, it's really dishonest. And it's on, interesting because in the, in the, in all the synods, the synodus where St. Athanasius says these things about scriptures, he then compares the Council of Nicaea's Creed to Scripture. He says he cannot but be reminded of by Scripture when you hear the Nicene Creed. So it's, yeah, it's again a big thing I've been trying to push, and maybe not as uh, eloquently as I should because I'm not very eloquent. Sorry, my dear audience, is that we have to like actually understand the context of the Fathers and the Ecumenical Decrees and the Canons. We cannot just look at these things hanging in isolation. So I had a show on this with Father Peter Hears recently uh, about how uh, the Roman Catholics in recent years decontextualized history to shoehorn their doctrines. And I think the Protestants suffer from the same thing because how could he say, oh, we have the biblical canon, Athanasius agrees with us, but then not agree with his view of asceticism? You know, it's a kind of like a poisoned well. Why are you taking water from this well if it's a poisoned well? Or at least, and this is the argument I make. Orthodox don't make this argument. We, we claim that the church is infallible. But I think it's reasonable to say, even if, let's say, there is no such thing as church infallibility, the church of the fourth century must at least be solidly reliable, which is different than infallible must at least be reliable where you're going to be getting their scriptures and their canons and their Trinitarian doctrines and for them to mean anything, right? If they're unreliable, right? If they are soteriological heretics, it just doesn't make sense. You'd be taking anything from them. It'd be like us taking books from the Book of Mormon. Like why would we even bother? They're heretics, right? And the idea that the church is infallible is not something that was made up at the time of the Council of Nicaea. All you got to do is read the treatise on the unity of the church by St. Cyprian of Carthage, who was a martyr under, under the Romans well prior to Nicaea, to see that this was something that was clearly understood. So it's the, the idea that, well, we can dismiss everything after Nicaea because it's a later accretion, but uh, uh, but we'll, we'll, the the early church was like the you know the guitar strumming Baptist. It's just not the tr- the case. There's just no evidence. There's nobody who believes what the guy who made that video 
uh, believes back in the second century of the church. Nobody. Uh, and he, it's interesting how they try to glam on to some certain stuff. Cause like, I'm sure we're going to be getting into the iconoclastic issue that they made such a big deal out of, but he, he tries to say, well, you know, the iconoclast had an ecumenical council and they had more bishops at it than a lot of uh, ecumenical councils. Well, they didn't have any representatives of any of the patriarchates, including Constantinople, which C was vacant at the time. And, uh, the the uh, big the, the, when we when he basically says well the Orthodox just pick and choose whichever councils they happen to agree with well there are certain criteria for what makes a council ecumenical and one of them is, is continuity with the previous ecumenical councils and although that uh, robber council claimed to be in continuity with the first six ecumenical councils Father John's obviously, talking about Hiro just so the audience is right. aware. Right. So w w it's obviously not in continuity with the Sixth Ecumenical Council when it issued a canon which specifically talked about not whether icons. iconography was allowable or not, but what kinds of icons are appropriate. And a key thing, there are several key things about that canon that, that really in, it should inform anyone who's looking at the iconoclast controversy and trying to decide, well, how do I know who was right? When you read that canon from the Sixth Ecumenical Council, which basically says you can't depict Christ as a lamb, <laughs> literally, because because that's a, a type of Christ. And we have, you know, we, we have the antitype, which is Christ himself. So we're not going to depict the lamb in the place of Christ. We're going to depict Christ himself. Well, one thing that that canon tells you is, is that no one at that time was saying, you can't make icons. It wasn't even a controversy that was, that was even on the radar screen. The church, one thing about the church that you can't deny is we have a good memory when it comes to the controversies in the past. You know, we have, we have Sundays of the Holy Fathers where we sing about the various controversies that the church has dealt with over the years. There was no iconoclastic controversy at the time of the Sixth Ecumenical Council. And if you go back a little further to the Fifth Ecumenical Council, I happen to have read the entire Acts and all the historical background that Robert Price, uh, uh, or was it Richard Price? I can't remember. But anyway, that Roman Catholic scholar that, that published that the, the Acts of the Fifth Ecumenical Council, and which I thought was going to be so boring, it would take me forever to get through. And I found it so fascinating that I read it like in a week. Uh, but one of the things that was interesting in there is he talked about how prior to the council, uh, you know, the, one of the controversies that led up to the Fifth Ecumenical Councils was what was, was what was known as the three chapters controversy, which these are three texts from three uh, writers around the time of the Council of uh, uh, Chalcedon that that uh, Monophysite said, "Look, you know, you you basically have Nestorians that you're uh, giving cover for." And, and so they objected to these three writings. Well, one of them was by Blessed Theodore. Uh, St. Justinian is, in, in this book, it talks about how he was complaining that there was a procession in honor of Blessed Theodore. This is after he was reposed, obviously, that had his icon being carried in the procession. And he's saying, hey, look, you know, no, no one's authorized an icon of Blessed Theodore to be taken to procession. Uh, you know, so so he was complaining about the fact that they had an icon of Blessed Theodore, but not that they had an icon. <laughs> that, that wasn't even that wasn't even a question. It's only with Islam that you have iconoclasm. The first outburst of iconoclasm was under the, the Muslims and the iconoclast emperors were all responding to Islam. And they came from areas where Islam had made a lot of inroads, and they thought that this is the way we're going to get all these people to come back into the church. These icons are the problem. Let's just get rid of them. And, uh, and so that's why the controversy erupted. There was no controversy prior to that. And the, 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 uh, another thing that I found very irritating in the video is he, he talks about the distinction between proskinesis or honor or veneration now, but no father do we mind do you mind tabling that for just a couple minutes sure, so i can sure. finish the, the audience question on hira okay and so i just want people to be clear the council of hira 
is not an ecumenical council because ecumenical council has a pretty simple definition given in session six of Nicaea two. And you can say, well, you're just picking the definitions you like, but hear me out, guys. All right. The Nicaea two says that all the patriarchates and all the synods have to accept the council. All the bishops, not just the patriarch, all their bishops and the whole world that actually says it must, the word of the council must go to the whole world must accept the council. So meaning the whole church must receive the council. So you think if all Christians receive something, that's a pretty good criteria. Now we, they could argue whether or not this criteria was met, but the point is this is the criteria of an ecumenical council. And by the time the Protestant Reformation, I don't think anyone would doubt whether that they were um, Coptics, Roman Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, they all had icons. And so by anyone's stretch, every synod in the Eastern Orthodox Church definitely, but even synods outside of that church had accepted icons. And so Nicaea too would have been met that criteria of ecumenicity. Now that being said, let's talk about Hira. Because it came up the film. Hira didn't even have a patriarch of Constantinople. It was chaired by the Metropolitan of Ephesus. Um, at that time, that isn't it. So, so people are aware, it, it, it actually literally met none of the criteria of the synodical receptions of an ecumenical council. So that's something where, oh, well, people went there and it was popular, but it's more than how many people that you could jam pack from modern day Asia Minor into a single room that determines an ecumenical council. So that's number one. Number two, when they talk about councils of the Council of Frankfurt, the Council of Paris, and and some of the Frankish anti-iconic uh, uh, councils, people need to be aware that the Franks were essentially a bunch of flip-floppers. So the Council of Rome in 769 had a Frankish delegation that signed on to Iconodulia. The Franks only became born again and an iconist when union was attained between Rome and Constantinople during Nicaea II, because then there was union. And so, Long story short, the Franks were against icons when they kept uh, were, were against the icons when Rome and Constantinople were on the same side, right? Because they don't want Rome and Constantinople the same side. But they were in favor of icons when Rome was against Constantinople, when Constantinople was iconoclast. And so when you realize they were just being purely political, there was just no conviction behind it. I think it really takes a lot of the wind out of the sails when you know the actual history. But to be fair, how many people in this audience have heard any of that until I just said it, right? So I'm not going to expect that the filmmaker heard of any of that. And we didn't even go through the sources in the response video. I, I, I could give sources if people are, are so inclined, but we have other topics to cover. So it's, to me, a honest mistake in as much as scholars make this mistake all the time. But like you, Father, you read, let's say, the Fifth Ecumenical Council. You read all the minutes. I'm convinced most people just don't do that. Because a lot of these misnomers would be corrected if people actually read the stuff they were critiquing. If they actually read Nicaea II, they would have had that definition of the ecumenical council. That makes sense, by the way. You know, yeah. if they actually read the history about Iconodulia, they they would know what happened in Rome 769. They would have known what the you know what happened in Hira and who chaired it, etc. The reality is people aren't. They're making decisions without having actually read the facts. So having uh, <laughs> Answer that, Father. You want to talk about uh, his discussion of uh, proskinesis? Well, one thing I would say, though, about the Frankish councils that you mentioned is my recollection is that part of the reason why they had the objections that they did was the way that the acts of the council were translated into Latin. So it was based on a misunderstanding. They weren't saying, "Hey, what are these whole what are these icon things?" You know, we don't have any icons. That they were they were basically they had icons. The question was is how do you treat icons? And the way that it was translated in the Latin, I think it came across more like it was worship due only to God rather than just honor. But the but the bottom line of it is when we talk about the reception of a council being necessary for it to be ecumenical, that doesn't mean that the reception has to be universal and, and unanimous right off the bat. Sometimes you have people who misunderstand and it takes a while for there to become a consensus. But the way you know that a council is ecumenical is that w when peace in the church results from it, ultimately. And at, at a certain point in church history, everybody says, you know what, that council settled it. 
and uh, and so it did. But one other thing I also want to say about the council of uh, Hiera or Hieria, however you want to pronounce it, he claim he basically wants to 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 con convince his viewers, that, hey, this council could be the Seventh Ecumenical Council because we agree with this. Th th this is our council. This is our Seventh Ecumenical Council. Let me read you one of the anathemas from the robber synod of uh, Hieria. It says, if anyone will not confess the holy ever Virgin Mary, truly and properly the mother of God to be higher than every creature, whether visible or invisible, and does not with sincere faith seek her intercessions as one having confidence in her access to God, to our God, since she bare him, let him be anathema. So, does the does the maker of this documentary accept that? Uh, d does he d does he earnestly seek the intercessions of the, of the ever virgin Mary that's you know higher than all creation? I don't think so. Uh, he just thinks that uh, well, they don't like icons and we don't like icons. But the other thing is, is that that council condemned having icons at all they they condemn making images of any creature at all they condemn making any kind of a portrait of a saint any kind of a portrait of christ which lutherans have lutherans have these images and and uh, so you can't you can't have your cake and eat it too if you say that this is an ecumenical council then you're idolaters because you i i i, I Love, uh, I think it's Arch Archway Books. The, they they have these rhyming story Bible stories. This is a, a Lutheran publishing house. I, I I loved them when I was a kid. I read them to my kids, and now I'm reading it to my grandkids. These things are full of images of Christ and the saints. So according to the so-called Seventh Ecumenical Council that this guy wants to affirm, that's that's rank idolatry. To be uh, fair, though, he's an Orthodox Presbyterian, so I think that the, uh, I think well, I, thought he was a I can't speak for, I think they would condemn the Lutherans. In fact, uh, I got married in a PCA church in okay. Schenectady, and from the all I remember, I can't say I was an expert in this in those days, but I don't think the PCA and the Orthodox Presbyterian Church in that town got got. Uh, I don't think they got yeah. in. Uh, I don't think they were getting along. <laughs> well, I, I, I for some reason thought that he was a he was I knew he was a more conservative Lutheran or I thought he was a more conservative Lutheran, but uh, maybe I just misunderstood it. I did like the fact that he consistently quoted from the King James in his uh, in his video, so I'll give him that much. There you uh, go. Okay, Orthodox James Presbyterian. James. Okay, all right. <laughs> uh, but the thing is, I'll bet you, I'll bet you that he probably reads Bible stories to his kids that have pictures of Jesus and the saints in it. I'll bet you he does. If he doesn't, then he's consistent. But most Protestants don't go down, go that way. The other thing is getting back to the the whole issue of icons and the uh, the differences between uh, proskinesis, which we would say would be veneration, but it literally means to bow, uh, and then uh, latreia, which is to to worship in the ultimate sense, which really is sacrificial worship. He, he thinks he's proved some point. He says, well, but the Second Ecumenical Council condemns not only proskinesis, but also Latria. Oh, well, no one ever noticed that before. Thank you for illuminating. You know, the, the, what he's not getting is, is the second commandment. Number one says you shall not make any King James graven image. The word is translated graven image is the Hebrew word pestle. Show me one example of any image that God commanded to be made being referred to in Hebrew as a pestle. It does not happen. Pestle only refers to idols, pagan images. And, uh, and God, in fi five chapters later, after he gave the Ten Commandments, starts talking about making images that are three-dimensional, images of cherubim. And so you can't take graven images and say this refers to all images of any kind. The fact that it says you can't make any graven image of anything doesn't mean you can't have an image of anything. It means you can't make an idol of anything. And yes, you can't, you can't bow to it. You can't worship it. You also cannot make it.
you can't have it. So, so you can't say graven images equal all images unless you are going to be consistent and you're not even going to have a driver's license with your picture on it. If you want to go full Amish on us, then we'll give you consistency. At least you, you can say that you're consistent. But if you interpret the second commandment that way, you cannot have any images of any human being, of any animal, of any plant. You cannot have a, you, you cannot have pictures. You can have geometric images like the Muslims have. And that's it. Yeah, it's 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 interesting. I, I have the same critique that I, I just think whenever a an iconist apologetic cites Exodus chapter twenty, they, they're already making no sense. It's already incoherent because we obviously don't take Exodus chapter twenty exactly at its word because they make angels and they make other images, you know, ox, oxen and stuff, um, holding the, the the bath and all these things. So it's it's a non-starter. Don't, don't cite something that's incoherent. Now, that being said, we actually have the criteria why God is not depicted in the Old Testament. And it's given by Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 15 to 16, which says, God says, Take careful heed to yourselves, for you saw no form when the Lord spoke to you at Horeb, out of the midst of the fire, lest you act corruptly, corruptly and make for yourselves a carved image in the form of any figure, the likeness of male or female, right? So God's saying, you did not see a form of myself, so you cannot make a figure of myself, male or female. Now, do, does that apply when Christ the God-man is incarnate, <laughs> right? Does that apply? Obviously, it does not apply. It doesn't apply to the criteria that God himself gives, the whole criteria of anachronism is scripturally incoherent. And when I have oppressed uh, people, I had a debate with Turt and Fanny. I respect him very much. I think he did very well in the debate. But I pressed him on just what is his criteria for this? And I, I keep seeing that they dabble with Nestorianism. Well, that's the man that you could depict, but you can't depict God. But the scriptures say that the word was made flesh. Right when you look at the flesh, you're seeing the flesh of God. And if you've so, seen me, you've seen the Father. Well, when you see Christ, you're 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 seeing the human form. You're you're not able to see the invisible essence of the deity. You're you're seeing the human form. But he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. To put it in theological language, an icon does not depict the human nature of Christ. It does not depict the divine nature of Christ. It depicts the hypostasis, the person of Christ, which is both divine and human. Right. Now, in that hypostasis, the I would say the divine is invisible because the divine doesn't have a form. <laughs> the human has a form. But the depiction is of the hypostasis. And so because we have Chalcedon and we understand their ecumenical councils, this is coherent to us. This makes sense. Right. But anachronism is theologically ad hoc. They just don't like icons. And so they kind of devise these theological reasons for it, which make no sense with the Christology of the early church. Right. And so that's why they start dabbling in the historianism and things that really don't make sense because they have to in order to justify um, their anachronism. Now, there is a more advanced critique, which I won't get into because it wasn't the critique of the film, which is, well, we could depict God. We just can't venerate God. Um, but that wasn't the specific critique of, of the film's maker. So I don't want to impute that to him. And, and we cover that in other videos. But I'm happy you brought that up because I just think Exodus chapter 20 is a non-starter. And uh, if you don't mind me just rapid fire in a few things, he says that, you know, for example, the uh, that things that other than God don't accept uh, proskinesis, but you know this isn't true. Um, granted, an angel rejects proskinesis in Acts chapter ten and Revelation chapter nineteen, but an angel accepts proskinesis in Numbers twenty two thirty one and Daniel eight eighteen. So it's we have both in the scriptures. You can't just focus in one and at the exception of the other. Um, we will bow to kings historically and stuff like that. It doesn't mean we're worshiping them. We're not offering a propitiatory sacrifice to angels or to kings or to icons or to anything 
of that effect. And I just think that's worth bringing up. Um, so Father, well, we I also know. have this, we also have the Psalms literally commanding people to bow to the Ark of the Covenant. Yes, yeah, so and not bow, bow, um, bow towards or whatever, because I know that well, people well, translate well, it differently. I, I got into a, a, a little bit of back and forth with Gavin Ortland on this subject, and, uh, and he, he said, well, you don't understand the use of the prepositional lamed in Hebrew. Well, you know, I had two years of Hebrew in college. I wouldn't say I'm a Hebrew expert, but I know enough of, you know, of the grammar to know how Hebrew works. And what I pointed out to him is it, you have countless examples in the Hebrew Bible where w when we say to worship the Lord, the prepositional lamed is there. So the prepositional lamed doesn't get you out of uh, uh, anything here. That just means you bow to this. That, that, that you can, and you can translate it as you worship, but the word literally means bow. It has the implication of worship in the sense of, of, uh, you know, of honor, but the ultimate worship is sacrificial. And we never offer sacrifices to images ever. Uh, that that's that's where we draw the line, and uh, but we do offer honor. Just like you mentioned, there's honor that's offered to people in the Old Testament. It's never condemned. Uh, Abraham bowed to the people of Hebron when he was buying the cave of of Machpelah to bury his wife in, and uh, there's no indication that he was condemned for that. Uh, there's there's countless images examples of people bowing to other people, and this is not condemned, and that is a form of honor. When we talk about the angels that that said, "Don't bow to me," uh, you know, it's it's hard to know exactly you know what was going on there. Uh, you the different fathers say different things. One explanation that you sometimes get is that maybe. Uh, the, the saint in question mistakenly thought that he was looking at, at, at God and was offering in his heart uh, more than just honor. But personally, I don't think that that makes a whole lot of sense. I think it's more likely that you have angels that when St. Peter bows to them, says, hey, wait a minute, St. Peter, you know, chief of the apostles, don't bow to me. Because the angel's not thinking that he's worthy to be bowed to by St. Peter. And the same thing is true of the Apostle John, the, the person who, who uh, Christ in, uh, entrusted his mother to, the great theologian, the last of the apostles. I, I, I think that the angel just said, look, I'm not, I'm not worthy to, to have you bow to me. I'm just a fellow servant. Especially in Revelation, the gates are named after the apostles. Right. So like they're not named after the angel. <laughs> so it's sort of like you'd have a superior bowing to an inferior. In that and you have St. John making the same mistake, if that's what you want to argue twice. And St. John wasn't a dummy. You know, he, he wasn't he, he wasn't a slow learner. Uh, so I, I, don't, I don't think that you could say that he, he made he the same mistake twice. That time, right. <laughs> um, so those arguments just don't hold water. It's uh, like I said, it's because, and again, when it's inconsistent with other examples within the scriptures as well, um, we already see a problem, just like with the Exodus chapter 20 argument. It's not a good argument unless it's consistent all the way through. If we see inconsistency, either we could be, and we'll talk about this, we could be like theological liberals that go, well, this is incoherent and we reject it, um, which I think is actually, he treats holy tradition like how the liberals would treat the scriptures. They, they focus in on uh, the contradictions and, you know, and, and discount the authority things based on that, yeah. which uh, I'd rather not take a page from, from the liberals on this stuff, but it does seem that's something people do when it suits them. Uh, but that being said, when we see something that contradicts, I think then we're challenging, all right, then maybe how we're interpreting it's wrong, because if we can have interpretation that makes these not contradict, Obviously, that's preferable when we're speaking about God's revelation. Now, I just have a couple uh, real quick, rapid-fire critiques of his uh, of his critiques of the icons. Um, for example, like uh, I think it was fair that he focused on the Damascene 
and his sources. But like I said, just by saying, all right, well, he got some sources wrong and that makes everything utterly unreliable. Like maybe he's not a reliable historian, but that's not how we settle this question. Uh, that's why I have argued that we could find pre-Nicene Iconodulia and I have several examples are brought up in debates and in articles and whatnot. He makes mention in the film that early art was mere decoration, I actually quote him, mere decoration, but he offers no evidence in this conjecture. Um, I just don't see on what basis we would accept that it's mere decoration when no one actually calls it mere decoration. This is something I reminded um, Dr. Ortlund and others again and again and again. We, whenever we have the, the actual reasoning given for the art's existence, it's always for its veneration from the historical sources. So where do we get this mere decoration from, which is in not in any of the sources? It's well, very besides that, besides that, that's inconsistent with the robber council uh, of the iconoclast. Nobody in that council was arguing, you can have icons, you just can't venerate them. That, that was not the argument. You can't have icons, period. You can't make them because they were applying the second commandment consistently to icons. Uh, uh, but you know, it, if you're, it, that's not what these people want to do. Now, it is true that after the Seventh Ecumenical Council, you did have some iconoclasts that started trying to come up with a way to bridge the gap by saying, "Well, you can have icons as long as you don't venerate them." So Saint Theodore of the Studite responded to some iconoclasts that were making that kind of an argument, but that was never really the mainstream iconoclastic view. Anyway, it was always you can't make them. Because if, if icons are graven images, you can't make them, you can't have them. You, you, you don't even get to the veneration part because you can't have them at all. So clearly that's not what was going on. And the, fact, the mere fact that you have icons throughout church history shows that the iconoclasts were wrong. That's, that's all you need to prove, really, to show that that council was a false council. Now, other than that, we have... Uh... He said that he quotes St. Augustine for saying no one's seen the countenance of Mary. I just challenge people to read the rest of the passage. It's not really a kind of dry historical observation like as it's presented. And I found it interesting he quoted Leviticus chapter 10 and offering strange fire. Because to me, that obviously, if we're going to typologically apply it to anyone, it's going to be to the Protestants, right? They don't have apostolic succession. They've kind of made their own priesthood you know, um, their own Eucharists, aren't they the ones offering strange fire? So it, I just kind of found it strange that it was quoted as something against us. Um, and that's pretty much all of uh, the topics on I kind of do, I'd like to bring up this again, for those watching, I have whole videos on this topic. I have whole videos with Protestants giving just their views, by the way. So I'm just giving highlights from the film. Uh, well, one thing I would them. add on the subject of icons before we move on sure. is uh, he makes a lot of supposed uh, later forgeries. And in particular, he talks about the icon not made with hands and says, well, you know, Eusebius doesn't talk about this as a miraculous image or he doesn't mention this miraculous image. So therefore, the later accounts are spurious uh, forgeries. As you mentioned in your written critique, you know, if you, you could apply the same kind of skeptical scholarship to the scriptures themselves. And so if you want to go with mainstream uh, biblical scholarship, you could say, well, the pastoral epistles are, are a forgery. Yeah. Uh, First and second Peter are a forgery. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the book of Hebrews, you know, we don't know who even wrote it, you know, so uh, it, there, there's a whole bunch of the scriptures that Protestant scholars of a more liberal bent will say, well, this is a later edition. This is obviously written long after the fact. And also when he talks about the lives of the saints and he, men he, he mentions some of the miracles and he says, well, basically he's looking at it like a, a, a secularist empiricist and say, well, these miracles sound pretty outlandish. So we can kind of dismiss these accounts. Well, the problem conservative Protestants have is they they just grow up accepting that Jonah was swallowed by a, a big fish and he lived in the fish for three days and then was spat up on the, the, the shore and he survived all that. And, 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 you know, they don't have a big problem with that story 
because they've grown up hearing it and they just said, well, that's in the Bible. So it has to be true. And it is in the Bible. And I believe that it is true, but you can't say God can create a fish that can swallow a prophet and he can live in that fish for three days and then be spat up on the shore and, uh, and survive all of that, and then turn around and read an account from the lives of the saints that talks about some big miracle and say, well, this obviously didn't happen because that kind of stuff doesn't happen. Uh, but as far as the image of Odessa is concerned, one thing a lot of Protestants have uh, spent a lot of time talking about is the, the, the Shroud of Turin. And uh, the connection between the icon not made with hands and the Shroud of Turin is obviously something that one could debate but i do remember seeing documentaries where they were examining spores on the shroud of turin and they were able to show that there were spores on that shroud from palestine and there were shores on that shroud that were from plants unique to the edessa area and then there were spores from Constantinople. I mean, basically, you can trace the history of where that shroud had been by the spores that had attached themselves to that shroud. And the fact that it did go through Edessa is a you know pretty big reason to think that there could be a connection. And uh, what a lot of scholars think is that the image not made by hands is basically the shroud of Turin folded up to where only the, the face is showing and that it was kept in a case and that at the time of the crusades it was then taken by latin crusaders eventually found its way to turin uh, and a lot of protestants have said well this is proof of the resurrection of christ here we have the shroud that nobody can explain how it came into existence and uh you know maybe this guy who made this documentary poo poos all that but I, I i think that it's not a totally outlandish connection and here you have a lot of empirical evidence to back it up. And it is kind of interesting that the, sh the image of Christ on the shroud matches the basic image of Christ that you find in Orthodox iconography, and it's consistent. You can see almost any icon of Christ that's ever been made, and you don't have to have a label that says this is Jesus Christ. You, when you see it, you know that's Christ. And that, how, how do we wind up with a consistent depiction of who Christ is? Well, there had to be some prototype image that everybody else was making copies of for us to have an idea of what Christ looked like. And I think that's not an outlandish explanation. And then another thing he does with, with the lives of the saints is he, he talks about two lives of the saints that have similar elements where a, a lion buries the body of the saint. Well, obviously, that can't be true, right? Okay, you know what liberal Protestant biblical scholars say? The fact that we have stories in Genesis of Abraham twice pawning his wife off as his sister, and then Isaac doing the very same thing. It obviously, it could not have happened three times that this, that, that this whole thing happened that way. This clearly is the same story being told three different ways. Well, do, do conservative Protestants accept, accept that argument? No, they don't. They say, well, the fact that this, you know, it happened once means it could happen twice, which means it could happen three times. And, uh, you know, there's lots of examples from history where the same thing kind of happens over again. Like you take the battle of uh, first and second Manassas or first and second Bull Run, depending on whether you're a Yankee or not. <laughs> uh, that the you have this uh, you have a battle that happened on the same battlefield. Some of the same generals were involved in both battles. <laughs> and the outcome was the exact same. The Confederates won. So a thousand years from now, you could have liberal scholars, you know, looking at this and saying, well, this is clearly the same story being told twice. It got garbled <laughs> in history, but it just could not be that the Yankees would have gotten their rear ends kicked twice on the same battlefield it couldn't happen and stonewall jackson is involved in both of these that just is suspicious isn't it well we know that it happened because we had tons of contemporary accounts of it happening and another thing i would point out is in terms of like amazing things that you read about in the lives of the saints saint john of shanghai lived in living memory 
And there are people who are still alive today that have have testified, and not just one person, that they saw St. John of Shanghai levitating in prayer. Uh, these are contemporary accounts. They're, they're people that you can go and question. And so if you're going to be a skeptic, uh, you know, you, you, can, you, can, you can try to dismiss these things all you want, but these are things that there's a lot of evidence to believe that people actually saw these things. It, it's hard to imagine that all these people are just making it up. Now, it's uh, a lot to be said about that, and I think that the issue of hagiography is not something I want to perhaps treat in this when it comes to this broader how do we read hagiography. It's uh, something I do uh, cover in my review on my website, orthodoxchristiantheology.com, so I welcome people to read that. But yes, it's we can't be looking at th the things of God with a materialist epistemology where just we reduce everything to um, just like how we would ap approach a, sci a scientific experiment or something like that. I think we often will find uh, wrong theological conclusions if we do that. And it would eviscerate the Christian religion, as you were referring to. Right. It's the same thing the liberals do. Um, because like, there was much with this. Damascene sources, St. Dionysius the Areopagite. And, and all sorts of stuff where it's like, all right, well, the liberals do this with the scriptures. So it's, it, we don't want to eviscerate ourselves in the process of these critiques. It's not a critique that I think makes no sense and isn't worth discussing, but that's why my response to this is we have to look more broadly about how we treat certain uh, religious sources. Well, now, one other thing I would, I would point out that, that's related to this is he keeps talk, he kept talking in this video about how, well, we don't have any record of this prior to, you know, a thousand years after it happened or something like that. There's a lot of stuff in the Bible that we don't have any, 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 any evidence that it was written down for thousands of years prior, you know, after it happened. And so if you're going to use that kind of argumentation to dismiss something, then you might as well just say the book of Genesis can just be wadded up and thrown in the trash. Because if you, if you look at the events that are recounted in the book of Genesis, and then you go to the time of Moses, there's a lot of time that passed before that stuff was written down, particularly the earlier parts of the book of Genesis. So you just can't, can't have your cake and eat it too. Now, the issue of Mary I, is a big part of the film. To be honest, I think the, the real opposition to Orthodoxy or Roman Catholicism ultimately has to do with the saints. I think they don't know the saints, so they don't love the saints, and so they find something they don't love that other people love bizarre, right. which, which is understandable. Um, like icons, again, I want to be fair to the filmmaker. There are plenty of scholars that agree with his views about Icons. There's probably less, especially in recent years, about some of the Mary and Saint stuff. They've moved pretty much in favor of the venerations early and it's across the board. Um, but he at least gives at least a knowledgeable critique of like they're part of Angelicum. And but again, a lot of those same modernist principles, like, well, if it's falsely ascribed, then we can throw it in the garbage can. Just like, you know, what the liberals would do with the Gospel of Matthew or the Gospel of John or Paul not writing Hebrews. You could just throw them in the garbage can if they were falsely ascribed or something like that. But I, I do want to at least point people's attention that recent scholarship like Nutzman's has really brought out the authentic Jewish elements of the part of Angelicum, where this doesn't, it really honestly doesn't look like this thing was falsified from some Greek guy that had no understanding of how Judaism worked. Um, scholarship is shown from looking at the um, Talmud and uh, Josephus and Philo that, in fact, there's these little subtle details in the part of Angelicum which show a very um, strong understanding of Judaism. Now, that doesn't prove necessarily that the events that are, that are entailed in it actually occurred. It just proves whoever wrote those events down understood Judaism and so at least he had some sort of idea of the context that he was trying to illustrate. So I just think people should take a look at Nutzman's research on the Proto-Evangelicum. Um, and I think anyone who's read the Jewish sources 
uh, from the first, second centuries carefully would come to the same conclusion. Um, I find that his critique of, let's say, he says, well, the Orthodox just pick the people in history they agree with, but he does the same thing with Marian doctrines. So like, oh, well, Origen, Clement Alexandria, they don't count anymore because they believed in the perpetual virginity. Um, he seems to say that Irenaeus taught the same thing. Um, and so it's like all of a sudden we could just discount these people because they disagree with me. It would also seem to disagree with the fact that this came from Gnosticism. Um, really, the only source that would teach a Marian doctrine um, very early on, would there be another by the third century? But by the first century or maybe the second would be the ascension of Isaiah. Uh, but I'm going to now share a screen of a list of sources before Nicaea that taught Marian veneration. So let me uh, put that share screen here of John and I, of Father John and I, really small. And hopefully there it is. And so I'm going to give a list. They are essentially in chronological order of texts that have perpetual virginity, prayers, all sorts of Marian doctrines. We have the Proto Evangelicum of James, paragraphs 19 to 20. We have the Odes of Solomon, the 19th Ode. Now, just so you know, he criticizes it as Gnostic, but the most recent scholarship has really turned against this. Um, Syriac writings, due to the, uh, the gender of what spirit is, uh, will use certain language which people, I think, with a juvenile mindset would find maybe too sexual, which is really nothing sexual about it you know, like the breastfeeding language and stuff like that. It would be sort of like liberals saying that, oh, well, Jesus is wisdom and he's called a female in Proverbs. And that means, you know, Jesus is trans or some sick thing that some sick person will yeah. come up with, right? Um, again, if we look at these things charitably and we look at Syriac sources as a whole, this is something that's kind of common, which is why recent scholarship has turned against that sort of uh, baseless condemnation of the old Solomon as Gnostic. We have a, a fragment from Hegesippus. We have St. Melito of Sardis in Fragment 17 in the Bodmer Papyrus. We have the Gospel of Bartholomew 417 in the Vienna Manuscript. Just so people are aware, there's more than one manuscript, so there could be some debate whether the original um, had uh, a prayer to Mary. We have the Ascension of Isaiah 11, 12 to 14. This is Gnostic, so the others weren't, but this one is, just so people are aware. We have the Clement, uh, Clement of Alexandrian Stramata, Book 7, Chapter 16. All right, third century origin, the commentary of the Gospel of John, book one, chapter six. We have the book of Mary's repose. People can look at paragraph 135, which is page 349 in Schumacher's 2002 book. Um, this is a Gnostic text, so people are aware. But we also have from the same era, which I think is earlier, the Dormition or Assumption of Mary. Um, it's ascribed to St. John. It's pseudo-John usually in the scholarship, paragraph 47 or page 396 in Schumacher's 2002 book. Again, earliest scholar in dating, second to third century. St. Gregory the Illuminator concerning the Holy Mother of God, paragraph 27. Again, dated to the third century by its translator and the person, I think he's the same guy who discovered the Armenian text, which is what's preserved him. The Grotto of Nazareth, which is a prayer of Mary, which we've talked about before this channel. Um, Subtum Presidum, which we talked about, which he admits it has an early dating, it has a later dating. The six books, Apocryphon, which again um, has, is chock full of Marian doctrines. Uh, it's also in Schumacher's book. And the anaphoras of Coptic slash Egyptian basil, which have a prayer uh, to the Theotokos. Now, an in inv in invocation of prayer for people who want to be really detail-oriented. So there is 15 sources by their earliest scholarly dating uh, with Marian doctrines and prayers. 15, not one, not two, 15. We've got name brands with that. We had Hegesippus. We had uh, we had Hegesippus there. We had uh, Origen. We had Clement of Alexandria. Um, if you notice, we had St. Gregory the Illuminator. Like, I didn't quote, oh, Irenaeus knew Eve, right? I didn't go with the stuff that is ambiguous enough that they could interpret according to there's nothing um, exclusively orthodox about this. I purposely went with sources which could not be interpreted in any other way, and you have 15. And two are Gnostic. The vast preponderance are not Gnostic, and then that's beyond the proportion of what we have of early pre-Nicene texts. Uh, it's, that means it's, it's more strongly in the Orthodox or Proto-Orthodox mold. 
People could argue to the cows come home that, oh, well, just because it's the earliest scholarly dating, I prefer a later scholarly dating. Fair enough. But the point is an intelligent person could look at these 15 texts, right? Because scholars are at least theoretically intelligent and go, well, we have an intelligent basis that these are pre-Nicene. And when you have that many, it becomes really hard to avoid that, all right, even if one or two are ascribed wrong, you just have too many where to say, this is our, this is just a later accretion because of Theodosius or some other conspiracy theory. Now, I just want to, at the same time, I'm going to read a list for prayers to the saints because really the whole objection is not really Mary specifically. It's not to the Theotokos. It's the prayers to the saints. And it's a way bigger list than people think. And uh, this is stuff like I've been putting together. I've not seen this anywhere else. Now I'm going to include a couple Jewish sources in this. So, uh, so number one is first Enoch, uh, one Enoch nine three. Now Enoch is quoted in the Epistle of Jude, so it's arguably a kind of Christian source, but it's originally from Judaism. And so we have a prayer to an angel there. Saint Melito of Sardis again, fragment seventeen. The Gospel of Bartholomew again. Uh, 417, the Testament of the Patriarchs, 3.5, has a prayer to the saints. Acts of Andrew, verse 38, has a prayer to the saint. Acts of Paul, 10.5, prayer to the saint. Shepherd Hermas, in Latitude 5.4, is a prayer to the angel. St. Apollos' Commentary, Daniel, book 2.31, has a prayer to the uh, to the youths in the fire. Origin on prayer, chapter 6, 7, and 10, has uh, a kind of detailed defense of prayers to the saints. The Strasbourg Papyrus, which is dated to perhaps 200, has invocation of prayers to the holy prophets, apostles, and martyrs. So we have that. We have a Gnostic text, Zastrianos, verse 13. So of all of these, we have a Gnostic text. And we have a Jewish text from the 3rd century, Barakot, um, AZ-17a, which has uh, prostrations and prayers at the grave sites of the patriarchs. We have Eusebius of Caesarea who's quoted as follows. For we are accustomed to glorify their sepulchers, there to offer prayers and vows and to venerate their blessed souls. And we declare that we are right in doing these things. And just some people know that's quoted in Percival, who's a Protestant, Invocation of the Saints, page 163. Um, and we covered some other, by the way, uh, prayers to the saints, like sub to presidium and stuff above. But so... My point in sharing these is we have some like 16 or more sources with prayers and saints pre Nicaea and with big names like Eusebius. These aren't like random guys or, and I think only one was from a Gnostic text. Well, two, no, two, because one was in a, uh, a Gnostic Dormition homily. So there are two out of all these are Gnostic texts. So any historian is going to conclude that this originated in Judaism, being that it exists in Jewish texts before Christianity. It then was in apostolic Christianity, and then the Gnostics borrowed it. That's the most likely conclusion. And so it's just too many sources. That's what I bring up in this response. It's just too many sources where we could say these are accretion due to some conspiracy theory. Now, to be fair, um, this is cross-disciplinary. We have scholars that look at Gnosticism. We have scholars that look at early apostolic Christianity. We have scholars that look at Judaism, but very few will look at everything. And so people don't see the whole picture. But when you put that whole picture together, you realize, wait, no, this is very pervasive. Uh, the veneration of relics, the prayers of the saints, does not come up in an intellectual vacuum. There's a reason why those around Jesus thought he was invoking Elijah, right? It was expected. That's even quoted in the scriptures. They thought that he was calling on Elijah. So this is something from Judaism, and it's found in Christianity People follow up on the sources, which is why I give page numbers. Um, and so that's my comment on that, Father. Let me give you some time to respond. Well, one other thing I would point out is that the uh, earliest catechism that we actually have a record of that uh, contains what was taught to Christians, St. Cyril of Jerusalem's catechetical lectures, talks about prayers to the saints. Um, it's not pre nicene but what we have to understand is, is that um, there's a reason why in our services to this day, we have things like of thy mystical supper of son of God, accept me today as a communicant for I will not speak of thy mysteries to thine enemies. 
uh, St. Cyril's catechetical lectures begin with him saying, now don't write down anything I'm about to say. <laughs> and obviously somebody didn't pay attention to what he said and they went ahead and wrote it down anyway. Uh, uh, but there, there, there was a concept of a secret tradition, not secret in the Gnostic sense that it was only the illumined few that kept these secrets. But there was this idea that we're not going to teach the inner teachings of the church to everybody because we're casting pearls before swine. If we do that, we're going to, these things need to be kept within the church, which is what St. Basil the great talks about when he talks about tradition. He says that there's the charisma of the church, which is the public proclamation of the gospel that's available to everybody. And that's what you find in the new Testament. But there's also the inner dogmas of the church, which are just for within the church. And these things were not talked about, broadly speaking. That's the reason why in the New Testament, you don't have a, de a detailed account of how you celebrate the Eucharist. Because that was part of the inner teachings of the church. You didn't need to know that unless you were actually a communicant. Uh, and, and so that wasn't something that was just out there for everybody to, to, to view and examine. And so... Uh, and you don't have any complete catechisms prior to that. So you to, to say, well, it's a later post nicene and accretion, you, you have no way of knowing that you, there's no basis for saying that this wasn't what was taught prior to Nicaea. This is the only early catechism that we have. Another thing I would point out, he, he makes quite a bit about the feast of the entry of the mother of God, the entry into the temple and, uh, presents it as this preposterous st story. Well, I have an article on this subject on my blog, and the title of it is, Is the Feast of the Entry Historical? I believe that's the, the title of it anyway. But uh, um, there are aspects of the way, I mean, for one thing, we should point out that the Proto-Evangelion of James, contrary to the way that it's often talked about, is not the source for the feast of the entry of the Theotokos. It's a record of a tradition that was circulating prior to it being written down. So it is a witness to this tradition. It's not the source of the tradition. Um, but, the, but the other thing is, is in terms of, you know, in the, in, the, in the hymnody of the church, we talk about the Virgin Mary entering into the Holy of Holies. Now, if that literally happened, it would have required God to have worked a miracle for it to have happened. So it, I wouldn't say that it didn't happen literally. I would just say that if, if we're talking about what's probable, you know, that, that seems like it's not the most likely thing that would have happened literally. The thing is in the hymn of the church, we often talk about things in more figurative ways than are to be taken literally. For, for example, in the Akathos hymn to the mother of God, we have this conversation back and forth between the Archangel Gabriel and the Virgin Mary that's not recorded in the Gospels, but it's it's sort of a poetic way of talking about spiritual truths about the Incarnation that's not meant to be taken absolutely literally. And I think that when it talks about the Virgin Mary entering in the Holy of Holies, it's not unreasonable to think, well, maybe what they're talking about is the fact that she entered into the temple uh, and dedicated her life to the, the service of God. And so in a figurative way, we're talking about this as the Holy of Holies, but that's not meant to be taken literally. And one thing that I discovered when I dig, dug into this issue is not only do you have a lot of contemporary evidence that there were women who lived in the vicinity of the temple and like the Virgin Mary, according to the traditions, made things for the temple. You know, like they they made the curtains, they made the you know the vestments that the priests and the and the and the Levites wore. These women did things for the to make the 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 work of the temple possible. Not only do we have contemporary witnesses um, from the uh, Second Temple period, you find references to this in the Old Testament in, in the in the Law of Moses and also in the historical books. And and they're references that often people read, and the translations don't make it really clear what it's, what it's referring to. But when we really examine these texts, it's referring to a group of women who lived in the vicinity of the tabernacle and then later the temple who were dedicated to the service of God. And for example, 
one of the accusations against uh, the, the priest Eli, who later was killed by God at the time when the Ark of the Covenant was captured by the Philistines, he died. You know, he, he healed over and died. But he, he, had, he, had, he had already had a prophetic judgment pronounced against him uh, via Samuel. One of the accusations was he's allowed his sons to do all these horrible things. And among the things that he allowed his sons to do or he didn't punish them for doing was that they basically were, were going after these holy women and, and, uh, and sexually uh, using these women who had dedicated themselves to the service of God. It's interesting to me that Protestants have had no interest. I, I find very little commentary from Protestants about what does this mean? You know, I, there, there's these holy women living in the context of the temple and the tabernacle, and yet you hear almost nothing talked about the, these women. But another example of this is in the Gospel of Luke, where you have the prophetess Anna. She's living in the temple, we're told. So the idea that the Virgin Mary would have been dedicated to God and lived in the temple vicinity is not outlandish at all. There were women who did that. And we have in the pastoral epistles, as well as in Hippolytus, like the widow list, right? They, those uh, women who couldn't be married, they're too old, could essentially dedicate themselves to pray as a vocation. They're essentially right. nuns. Right. Um, in fact, in the life of St. Anthony, written by St. Athanasius, that's when the early comments say there weren't much monks in those days, like there's nuns. <laughs> so the, the original monastics were those on the widow list. So it's, and that's that hor horrible asceticism that we're yeah, being it's, warned it's, against. Yeah, asceticism is in, in the New Testament, uh, but we'll, we'll get in that in a little bit. But I, I do think I could see a critique, and I wanted to give a response to the critique, which would be, well, these sources are anonymous. They're, yes, there's some name brands, but there's a lot that aren't name brands and, and whatnot. And so that makes them more dubious. And I think this is just when, if we have a devotion that's not under debate, we are going to expect it in devotional sources, like in apocryphal gospel, which is written just as a devotional source. Right. Um, that's where we're more likely to find prayers and references to devotional practices. You're not going to write them in a uh, find them an apologetic work to a pagan right. who doesn't take part in these practices. And so because of that, it's what, it's not even that these sources are as rare as people think they are. They're just not found where they're looking for them. They're looking for them in apologetic and, and, and apologetic sources and in letters where let's say, let's say St. Cyprian's letters where, you know, he's talking about practical matters, but they're not looking into the devotional sources where you would expect to find these things. Right. right. And so if you're looking for something anywhere other than where you should expect to find it, you're not going to find them. Right. It's it's again, it's so much of what I do is just talk about, you know, how do you do proper historical inquiry? Because if you don't do proper historical inquiry, you're going to get to wrong results. So um, I just thought that was worth bringing right. up. Um, I did want to bring up something interesting because this is something that I've looked into over the years and had to change my mind about. It's a interesting quip made by um, St. Jerome, where he says that Victorinus of Patau taught that the Theotokos wasn't a virgin. And it's it's brought up once without a lot of uh, critical interaction with Victorinus or anything, for good reason, which I'll get into in a second, um, in the film. Now, we don't have anything from Victorinus Patau that talks about the Theotokos. So the question is, is it just lost to history and all we have is St. Jerome responding to it? My opinion is St. Jerome had the wrong Victorinus in mind. We do have something written by Marius Victorinus. Uh, Marius, rather, Marius Victorinus has something on um, the Theotokos in his uh, commentary in Galatians. And the recent English translation, the scholar says in a footnote, that the Latin could be interpreted in two ways. It could be interpreted to mean that the Theotokos no longer was a virgin after uh, she gave birth to Christ, but it could also be interpreted to mean the opposite. It's sort of like a grammatical argument. And so my opinion is Jerome was offhand referring to something that was seized upon by Marinus Victorinus and just wasn't really critically interacting with it. You know, Victorinus was a near contemporary with Jerome. He wasn't a saint. Um, he lived in right. living memory from Jerome. 
So that being said, it's uh, I just think something interesting to bring up because even modern critical scholarship is like, well, it could actually be affirming, you know, the perpetual virginity of the Theta Tocqueville. So that one of the proofs against it actually become a proof in favor of it. If you're right. deep deep enough in the weeds, just so people uh, know, it's something worth looking into. Um, and granted, he kind of thinks of older scholarship that thinks Mariology is his later development, but like more recent scholarship from Dr. Stephen Schumacher really argues the opposite. And the point isn't to say, well, my scholar's better than your scholar. The point is, both of us have an intellectually respectable vantage point. And so the argument has to be from the sources. And that's why I gave a bunch of sources. And the sources really advey against the thesis given by the film, not because the filmmaker wasn't researching these things. I just argue that I maybe researched them a little more. And, you know, you and I are orthodox. We'd have more reason to because we're devoted to the Theotokos. We're devoted to the right. saints. We'd have more reason to. It's kind of hard to research stuff you don't care about. Right. You know what I mean? It's like me trying to figure out, you know, March Madness and college basketball. You know, <laughs> it's just not something I'm into. Maybe I could get into it next year, but uh, it's not something I've historically been into. So those are my comments on the issue that they had tokos in the saints i don't know if you have anything you want to add father well when it comes to the to the theotokos you have a fairly consistent tradition that goes way back that she was ever virgin and i, I think we probably talked about this before but the confusion comes because people from a non-semitic background reading the gospels references to the brothers of the lord and make the leap that this has to be brothers in the sense that we usually use the term. Yeah, that's just bad Greek. And, 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 and the problem is, is that in Semitic languages, they don't have a word for cousins. And they also and, don't have a word for uh, aunts and uncles. You know, they, 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 they I asked uh, a, a Lebanese guy in my parish to tell me how, how in, in Arabic today, would you refer to someone as being your uh, nephew or your cousin? And, and he's, he, he, he rattled off a bunch of stuff in there, but I said, okay, now could you literally translate that for me? And it says, you, you, it literally means the son of my father's brother. Well, human beings naturally try to abbreviate the way we constantly refer to people. And if you were constantly saying, hello, son of my father's brother, how are you doing today? You, you, that's too much verbiage there. In English and a lot of European languages, we would just say cousin. Hey, howdy, cousin. How are you doing? Um, but in Semitic languages, they don't have a, a, a way to say that. So they, what they would say is howdy, brother. Because brethren has a very broad sense in Semitic languages, which is why at the foot of the cross you have a reference to Mary, the mother of the Lord, and her sister, Mary, the wife of Cleopas. Well, you don't have to be a genius to know that it's unlikely that you have parents that name two daughters Mary. It's not impossible, theoretically. It's just not very likely that parents would name daughter one and daughter two Mary. Well, this is George Foreman, isn't every all well, his kids named George? Yeah, George the first, George the second, George the third. Okay, well, George Foreman is the grand exception to this rule, I guess. But, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but, in all likelihood, we're having a reference there to a relative of the Virgin Mary being referred to as her sister. And of course, and, if you take, if you, and if, something less less speculatory in the Septuagint, Lot is called Abraham's brother, even though he's a nephew. Even the though he's his Greek nephew, word, clearly. The Greek word Adelphi right. is used. So it's it's not like kind of this kind of uh, desperate apologetic that St. Jerome's given. It's actually this like very common in the Septuagint. It's well right. acknowledged anyone who's looked and, at the original languages. And St. Jerome was one of the few fathers who actually knew Hebrew. And you have some other fathers that knew Syriac, of course. And I think they had some insights into how Hebrew worked just because they knew a language that was very similar to Hebrew. But, uh, you know, a lot of fathers didn't have that access, but St. Jerome did. And he knew that they're, they're, this is used more broadly. So when you're, when, you're, when you're talking about how to understand a text that was written in a language that's not only different from yours, but is not even in the same family group, 
is your language. You have to be aware of the fact that that language may work in ways that are very different <laughs> than, than your own language. And the, and the way that brethren are referred to in Semitic languages doesn't work the way that it works in our language. Now, it's, let's talk about the issue of asceticism and will dovetail to soteriology. I was actually kind of pleased that he focuses his critique is on asceticism because it's so important to us and it almost never comes up in these conversations, right? right. No one ever talks about it. Just kind of take it as a given or it's not important, but it's pretty important to us. So I'm happy that he at least uh, carefully thought it out and, and gave a critique of it. Uh, I did find, though, the critique had some of the same modernist quibbling, like with Thecla, and, and it's interesting because that's a first century source with uh, Prayers for the Dead in it. But I don't, like, I think, and forgive me, I'm just going to put this as a stereotype to make it kind of easy to digest. The argument could be condensed as asceticism, yucky, right? Yeah. It's just like yucky, strange, weird, bad. And... I think we need to think about it a little more carefully than that, and I'm sure he has, but in our analysis, we have to add a little more to our criteria and how we evaluate whether it's good or bad. Because I want to challenge the audience this. You know, St. John the Baptist lived an ascetic life. Um, Galatians chapter 5 uh, talks about we're crucifying the, the flesh and the passions. I think that's 524, but it's the point of St. Paul talks about this. This idea of self-deprivation is not something that doesn't exist in the scriptures. I mean, First Corinthians chapter seven speaks about how it's better to be a virgin than to be married. Doesn't mean it's bad to be married. I don't know why people they can't understand there's good and there's better. It's like you go to AutoZone. There's the good battery and the better battery, right? right. So it's like if there's good. You could have a chaste marriage, and then there's better. You could be um, you could be celibate, but that not everyone's called to that, right? Right. And so in the same way, it's like, yes, there's there's self-deprivation all over the scriptures. It's sort of like I don't see – I think the critique really is. It's just the way it's practiced in Egypt and in some Eastern contexts. It's just strange and different, and, and that's what makes it bad. And I think for those who are not very experienced Orthodox Christians, reading something like the Desert Fathers could be very difficult, just like the sheer perfectionism that you right. would read those texts. I mean, it's made for humility. The kind of presumption is even the best of them are crummy and, and that's what makes them so holy, right? They realize how crummy they are. And uh, so that being the case, I think you just need to look at what the point of asceticism is. And I think the point of asceticism is to take away the worldly distractions so we could focus on God. And if we look at it through that lens, the question is whether the means are effective. Asceticism is not a means into itself like if you just lose weight you don't go to heaven for that right if you just don't have sex you don't go to heaven for that the idea is are we doing the, these things and in so doing becoming more faithful and closer to god and our argument is the saints that are called to asceticism do this successfully it's not the exclusive means but all of us have to do this in some way and apply it in our lives even the protestants think this they don't you know well the conservative good protestants right they don't believe in fornication um, they don't believe in sodomy, uh, maybe less these days, but I'd figure back in the day they didn't believe in gluttony and stuff like that. And so it's not that they reject that we shouldn't have all these ostentatious self-edifications. You know, we need to cut some of that out. The real issue is it's just what he sees in Eastern Orthodox tradition is foreign to him, and that's what makes it bad. It's kind of a, a geocentric criticism, I think. And so that's my critique of it. Um, Father, yours. Well, the thing about it, let's take the issue of fasting, for example. There are fasts that are, that are commanded in the law of Moses. The prophet Daniel, we're told, abstain from certain kinds of foods because he was de dedicating himself to prayer for a very long period of time. Um, St. James, the brother of the Lord, uh, in Josephus' account, I believe refers to as asceticism i know that eusebius certainly does and he was known as having knees like camels because he stood on his knees when he was praying and he was known as james the just by the jews because they they recognized him as a righteous man and he was he was a nazarite he did not and, cut his hair 
And then if I could interrupt you, just a really cool thing. Like Josephus records the death of uh, St. James and he records how within the Jews, there was some dissension. It was so scandalous that they'd kill someone like St. James. So it's, it's something that bears out. Uh, I think, I think he, he might even mention that. Uh, he, he might even mention, I, it's been a while since I've read it, that there were some who believed that that Jerusalem was destroyed because yes, they, that's they, they murdered uh, uh, St. James. Now, obviously, we know that it was because they murdered uh, you know, the Lord that the, the Jerusalem was destroyed, but it certainly didn't help any. <laughs> that they also <laughs> that they also murdered uh, his uh, his kinsman, mm-hmm. and uh, so here we have an example of a very ascetic man, and never is he presented in Scripture as being some sort of a legalistic Pharisee or anything like that. Uh, so, and and also. Um, you know, you mentioned St. John the Baptist. Well, the Pharisees were complaining, and, and also the, some of the disciples of St. John the Baptist were saying, hey, how come the Pharisees and the disciples of St. John the Baptist fast, and your disciples don't fast? What's up that's, with that? That's not fair. And, uh, and what, what did Christ say? He said, well, you know, when the bridegroom is with his friends, they're not going to fast because they're celebrating, you know, with the bridegroom. But when the bridegroom's taken away, what does it say? Then, then they will fast. fast. Mm-hmm. Well, you know what? If you're not fasting, you're not a Christian. That's what yeah. Christ is telling you. If you're not fasting, you're not a Christian. And uh, he, th- I believe in the video, he says, well, basically fasting is something that people should just do on an individual basis. N- nowhere n- nowhere in, in Scripture do you have any kind of a prohibition against communal fasting. As a matter of fact, it was commanded that they fast on the Day of Atonement. So everybody fasted on that day. So, and the Didache, so, the Didache says, "Don't fast like the hypocrites do on Mondays and Thursdays. We fast on Wednesdays and Fridays, right? The day right. Jesus was betrayed, and the day uh, Jesus was crucified, which is makes sense of what Jesus said to the disciples of John the Baptist, right? When I'm with them, they're not going to fast, right? There's no right. reason for them to fast on Mondays and Thursdays, and I can do Wednesdays and Fridays. I'm still here, right? <laughs> right? And, the, and the thing is, there was a very early practice of fasting for 40 days in commemoration of Christ's uh, fast after he was baptized. And there was also a fast connected to Holy Week. And a lot of times the fact that these things were not initially linked or cited as examples by Protestant apologists. Well, everybody had different ideas about these things. There was no consistent practice. Well, those of us that are Orthodox, we know how the church calendar works. And if you start a fast right after the Feast of Theophany ends, and it's not connected to Holy Week, a lot of times it's going to wind up being connected to Holy Week <laughs> because they, they come close enough together that uh, you could see why eventually it was decided, you know what, let's just make this 40-day fast always be the lead up to the fast during Holy Week. And, and just to clarify, Father, it's we're not saying that the precise days that we have is something infallible or can't change or can't be added. We, we know the date that some of these fasts were added, like the Dormition fast and whatnot. Right. Um, it's something we just all agree to do. It's part of our tradition. But the idea is that we could fast as prescribed. And if the church has a council, we modify the calendar or modify a fast or whatever, that doesn't undo anything. It just shows that this is our tradition as of now, and it's not something purely individual. It is something communal. Um, right. So it's the fact that if the Lenten fast, which it, it did, got longer or it changed in emphasis or whatever, there's some early fathers, for example, prefer fast on Saturdays. That's something that was in the West. You even find a few Eastern saints like St. Saint Epiphanius, um, but it's something that didn't win out in the East. It doesn't end the world. It just shows different preferences and what gain notoriety over time. It's just like what the most popular Protestant Bible translation in the early 1900s is different than the most popular Protestant Bible translation is in 2023. You know, the point is you need a Bible, right? It's it, what's popular and how you're using it could change a little bit. But it's so it's to me, it was kind of like this focus on a detail that wasn't terribly important. I don't know if you want to speak to that at all. Well, the other thing I would point out is, is, you know, I lived as a Protestant for like the first 23 years of my life. And uh, I don't remember anybody fasting w- with any kind of consistency. 
I, I actually kept a Wednesday and Friday fast for about a year. And the only reason I did it was because as a good Nazarene, I read a life of John Wesley. And when I read his life, it said that John Wesley fasted on Wednesdays and Fridays because that's what they did in the early church. So I thought, well, that's, that sounds, if it did in the early church, maybe that wouldn't be a bad thing. So I started trying to keep a fast as best as I knew how to on those days. Uh, but if you, if you only fast when you feel like it, it's amazing how many people never feel like it. <laughs> <laughs> and I would say probably about 99.9% .9 of Protestants never feel like fasting and don't. But Christ said, then they will fast. So, so if you're not fasting, then there's a disconnect there because Christ said that his disciples will fast. And I don't think most Protestants do. And I doubt that the guy who made this video probably fasts with any regularity. I mean, maybe he does. There are some Protestants that do, but it's pretty rare. Well, you know, it's ultimately can't judge that. He can, he can answer that or how he views uh, fasting. Yeah, and, and maybe, maybe he does. I'm just saying the odds are good that he doesn't. But if he tells me that he does, I'll accept that. I know that there are some Protestants that think fasting is very important. Yeah, it's certainly the odds are in yours. I haven't seen it in Presbyterianism. Yeah. I don't know as much about Orthodox Presbyterianism, though. There was, um, you know, in the Puritan period, there was this idea that occasionally they would declare a day of fasting. And it was it was communal. It was not just hey, let's let's just let everybody decide when they feel like fasting. But like during the Civil War, both sides of the Civil War declared certain days of fasting and humiliation because they were, you know, they were encouraging people to pray for victory and for their their soldiers. So that did happen in more, you know, in more distant, in the more distant past. It's just you almost never hear that. You know, we have Thanksgiving as an American holiday, but we don't have fasting and humiliation day <laughs> that, 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 that's not that's not a that's not a national holiday well actually we do now but i'm not going to say which day because i don't want to be deplatformed we do have humiliation <laughs> day. so that being said it's um let me get your view of his discussion on theosis it it seemed to me i maybe i didn't appreciate it so please forgive me but it seemed to me to be saying like St. Athanasius isn't teaching theosis, though it very clearly looks like it to me that he, that he is. Yeah, you have to really dance around what he says when he says God became man so that we might become God. Or you could also, I think, translate that as that we might become divine. That's about as clear of a statement of, of theosis as well, you Where do you get. think the filmmaker was coming from? Because did, he did treat that with some detail. I, I mean... It's, it could be just simply I'm so locked into how I'm used to reading it. I couldn't appreciate it. I'm, I'm wondering if you had more of an insight on that. Well, you know, being a Presbyterian, they, they have, there's no way to squeeze a, an idea of, of uh, theosis into the way they look at salvation because they look at it as it basically God saves us by faith, grace through faith, and it happens before we even believe. We're regenerated before we believe. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to believe. And uh, any idea that we can become like God in any sense, they they don't talk about. Um, you know, I came from a, from a Nazarene background, which is from the Wesleyan Armenian tradition. And they actually, in the holiness movement, talk about the doctrine of entire sanctification. And it's not all that foreign from the ideas of theosis. I mean, they, they lack the aesthetic understanding connected to theosis. The idea that it's a possibility is certainly there. And what's interesting is where did that come from? John Wesley read the church fathers. He, you know, he, he got, he basically read, uh, you know, you know, St. Isaac of, of Syria. He read uh, St. Ephraim the Syrian, the homilies of St. Macarius the Great, the Desert Fathers. And he came up with this idea, or he came to, to believe that it was possible to, to uh, become perfect as a Christian. Not perfect in some absolute sense, but to become a perfect Christian. Just like you, a tree could be a perfect tree in a certain sense. If, it, if it's a healthy, full-grown tree, it's a perfect tree. Um, and, and a Christian become, can become a perfect Christian in, in that sense, he believed. And he got it from the church father. So for me, when I started reading about orthodoxy and then I read about the doctrine of theosis, 
that was like the least problematic aspect of orthodox theology for me. It was like, okay, now it makes more sense than it did when I was in Nazarene. But I mean, the idea that it was a possibility was never a problem. Now, like, I don't know. I, does reading second Peter chapter one, Verse 2, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Right, well, so it, it kind of this lays out this promise to Theosis on the basis of becoming holy. I mean, yeah. it's, I, I don't know, it looks pretty clear to me. If you're a skeptical Protestant, though, you could just say that that's a forgery. It's a later forgery. Very Saint cool. Peter didn't write it, so you could dismiss <laughs> but it. But it's part of our tradition. So we'll yeah, and, and, I'm, and I'm sure that the guy who made this video would not say that. I'm just uh, kind of razzing saying, a little like, bit because you because I'm if you apply his own criteria to his own. Uh, what he accepts as authoritative, he winds up uh, cutting him, cutting off the branch that he's sitting on. Yeah, let's just, just take the Plumas' hats off, everyone, all around, right? Let's just take them all off. Isn't the most simple interpretation of St. Peter's saying is that we have this these teachings about sanctification and the grace of God that we may become partakers of God right. by repenting of these lustful sins, right? It's, it's exactly what the Orthodox make claims to in asceticism. I mean that that's well, the let, let's, let's go let's go to the Sermon on the Mount. Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Would Christ have said that if that didn't have any possibility of being a reality? I don't think so. I mean he wouldn't have said it without sin, but of course that's not possible because you're a bunch of evil sinners or something like that. He would have he would have clarified what he was trying to say if he was being ironic, but it's not presented as an ironic statement. Now, I'm just going to just rapid fire just a few things and give rapid fire responses. Um, he made some uh, statements on the atonement. I don't blame him for it because people, uh, they claim like the Orthodox don't even have a doctrine of the atonement, which is wrong. We do believe in a doctrine of substitutionary atonement. We've had a show on this topic. Um, there is a false claim that we doubt the existence of original sin and uh, – Again, I don't blame him for it because there's people that speak that way. But again, that's not true. We have councils that use the term. We, in fact, it's one of the canons of Carthage. We have to accept a doctrine right. of original sin. We don't believe in inherited guilt. We don't think we're guilty of what Adam did. We inherited a tendency towards sin, which makes us require God's grace so we can be saved. Right. right. So it's that fallen, deceitful heart um, that needs to be corrected by God's grace that we inherited from Adam. Right. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, we've done videos about this before, so I would refer people back to that. But even the people who say we don't believe in original sin, when you ask them, what is it that you're objecting to about original sin? That's what they're rejecting is the re inherited guilt, mm -hmm. which we don't we don't believe. But that's they assume that that is entailed in the doctrine of original sin, because that's how it's often presented in Western theology, but that's not how we understand it. Uh, he speaks of St. Irene of uh, Nicaea II, famous, a questionable saint. Um, we have, so, you know, I won't go to the list to defame any of them, but again, it's there, you'll find certain questionable things in the lives of some saints, but, you know, you'll find some questionable things in the lives of the reformers, you know, it's... you find you find questionable things you know, in the like lives Calvin of people and killing the Bible. Yeah, it's uh, look, look at look at the prophet King David. I mean, there's some problematic aspects of his life, you know, that are that are less than stellar. Uh, not you know, not the least he of which would be softy with his kids. Well, but you know, let's let's take his his <laughs> adultery with Bathsheba and his murder of of Bathsheba, Bathsheba's husband. I mean, that's a pretty yeah, that, that was kind of that was kind of nasty, you know. But but you know, if you want to take and the thing is, you can always take a negative view of how you read a text and what a lot of liberal Protestants do when they read about the life of David is they'll say, for example, that all that stuff in uh, first Samuel where David's saying how I would not dare touch the Lord's anointed, you know, so where he's not going to kill Saul. That was just D Davidic propaganda because he was gunning for Saul from day one. 
he just tells these stories because he's trying to say, look, my hands are innocent. I didn't do anything. And, and so but you can read all these stories as being Davidic propaganda to explain why David allied with the Philistines and participated in, in killing Israelites. And if you notice, which, all these people he made alliances with that, um, what, what's his uncle name? His name skipping my mind for the moment. Uh, the, his general. Remember uh, his uncle? Uh, is, it, is it Joab, if I'm remembering yeah, correctly? Yeah, yeah. That, right? Yeah. He kills a bunch of people, and he's like, well, I had nothing to do with it, Joab. you got to cry about this. This is wrong. <laughs> Right, my my that hands are my nice. hands are clean. I didn't do it. Well, you, <laughs> the thing is, if if you want to try to read into the text things that the text doesn't say, you can you can make David out to be a villain. Uh, but I don't think that's a fair way to read the text because that that's just a skeptical way of reading things into the text that the text doesn't say, and that's what he's choosing to do in the case of uh, saints. Mm-hmm. And one other thing that you you prompted my memory on about one other quibble I had with just the whole format of his documentary is there's a lot of examples of him just taking some random Orthodox person and presenting them as if they're the voice of Orthodoxy. And uh, among the, the, the worst example of this was he takes Lazar Puhalo, the very most retired, never an active Orthodox bishop in a canonical church, uh, and they quote him as if, you know, he's some kind of an authority, and he's not. And David Bentley Hart, uh, bless his heart, uh, you know, hmm. the guy has got, not got an orthodox bone in his body, and yet he's quoted as if he's some kind of an authority. The guy does not believe that the Christian faith is the exclusive truth. And uh, so he's not orthodox. He's orthodox in name. Uh, but he's not—he's not an Orthodox theologian by any stretch, and he's—he's he's a lot more of a of a Hindu Buddhist, you know, eclectic theologian than he is anything else. And 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 so, if I was going to do a video about Protestantism, and I was trying to say here's why Protestantism is false, if I was to take uh, Jimmy Swagger clips. And, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, what was the PTL people, uh, uh, you know, and, and uh, the TBN people, if I was only going to focus on the worst examples of Protestants that are in recent memory and quote them as if they're the representatives of Protestants, I would be justly accused of not being fair. <laughs> and, uh, and that's exactly what he did in this video. It's... Um... I think it's one thing I want to point out is he kind of makes his argument that because Jovinian existed, that that means therefore, um, therefore there were early Protestants uh, in the church. Um, show show me the Presbyterian that, in the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, or eighth century. I, I'd love to see him, but they're just so not there. I want to point out something that people haven't considered, and it's, it's in uh, St. Ambrose's letter 41, which is actually a, a quotation of popes uh, of a pope, uh, Suricus's condemnation of the Jovinianists. And so this pope uh, it describes the heresy of Jovinian as a preaching, another gospel than which we received, and, a promo and he calls them the promoters of the new heresy and blasphemy. Keywords new. Right, so they weren't saying here's a bunch of rabble rousers, um, same idea we don't like. They're like we never heard of this before, right? And so I just want to point this out. Now, of course, it's someone against Jovinian, so he might say, "Oh, of course he'd say such a thing." I'm just going with what the sources say. Jovinian never claims he's representing the majority of people, right? Jovinian could only he could only stretch to find two uh, two early church authorities in favor of his views. And, and, uh, and one of them, um, like I said, uh, with uh, Victor Rhinus is arguably a grammatical issue. It's really not even a good proof text. You can only right. find your tone. And so the reality is that, that doesn't actually show the preponderance of early Protestant ideas being stamped out by the, you know, the state church or something like that, some sort of conspiracy right. theory. The early sources invade the opposite. So I just want to point people to 
Letter 41 uh, in St. Ambrose's corpus. They could also read Letter 42 from St. Ambrose uh, where he get his response from a synod. The, the Jovinian's ideas were not popular. They were the opposite. That's what our historical sources say. Right. If, you take, if you take issue with the historical sources, there's nothing I can tell you. I can only tell you what the sources are. Besides that, you know, w one thing that uh, Protestants ought to consider about the question of whether the Virgin Mary remained a virgin, you have an account in the, in, the, in the Old Testament of somebody touching the Ark of the Covenant. And they were struck dead for it because this was the ark that carried uh, the presence of God. You also have the prophet Ezekiel talking about the a, a future temple, and uh, and the the eastern gate, and says the eastern this gate will remain shut because the prince has walked through the gate. And obviously, this is a reference to the Messiah. Now. If, if you accept that text and accept, okay, the Messiah walked through this gate, so nobody else could walk through this gate, and you just take that as a literal text, but then you turn around and say, but the Virgin Mary, who, who gave Christ his human flesh, it, it doesn't, the, the fact that you, you're claiming that she had at least four sons and three daughters after she gave birth to Christ, the fact that her womb was then occupied by all these other people, uh, that that's, there's no problem there. there that, 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 that a gate, no, you can't, no one else could go through this gate, but the Messiah, but the womb that by which Christ acquired his humanity, no big deal, no, no, no big deal at all. Uh, it's where's the scripture that says she lost her virginity? Where is the scripture that says she sinned? And exactly, and the thing you is, you look at the Gospel it's... of Luke. The, the Gospel of Luke very clearly says that when they uh, were were coming to Bethlehem prior to Christ's birth, and it says that she was great with child. So obviously, what that what does that mean? Well, anyone who's ever seen a pregnant woman knows what being great with child means. It says that she was Joseph's espoused wife. What does that mean? That means that they were betrothed when she was great with child. Now, at what point after that does anyone suppose that a marriage took place? The fact it's that they were betrothed wife. meant that they could legitimately refer to each other as husband and wife in Jewish culture. But in Jewish culture... Someone who's betrothed has all the responsibilities of being married, but none of the privileges of being married. So uh, at what point after the Virgin Mary was great with child, do they suppose that a marriage took place? There's no account of it happening in Scripture. Um, and also when Christ is at the foot of, at the cross and his mother is there and he's and he's entrusting his mother to his disciple, John, if if the Virgin Mary had. Um, four other sons and uh, and at least three daughters, one of whom is, is supposedly St. James, the brother of the Lord. You know, and so, so we're not, we're not, you, you can't say, well, these were unbelievers. St. James wasn't an unbeliever. So why would Christ not have said, you know, mom, your, my brother James will, will take care of you. Why, why would that not have happened? That would, it would have been an insult to his siblings if he had entrusted his mother to the care of his disciple when he had brothers and sisters, literally in the sense that we use the term, that would have been perfectly capable to take care of his mother. There's just no reason why any of that makes any sense. And uh, I just think on a basic level, how could someone become less holy as a result of God being in them? Right, so for Theotokos to lose her virginity, when virginity is a higher state, according to First Corinthians seven, doesn't mean being married is a bad state. All right? right, not the argument here. <laughs> the point is, it's a higher, better state. How could he lose the more ascended state by having God incarnate in you? It, right. it just—it seems to me very, very, very wrong. And there's just no scripture justifying um, the view. Right. The I want to take some time, and we are not going to be able to cover it. I think. Because it you could it could be a series of shows on the rewriting of history and right. ramifications of the critique. 
I think this critique was very um, strong, um, and not strong because I think it was correct, strong because of just what is considered correct in our culture. And the way, if you look at Orthodox sacred tradition, the way we look at, I don't know, the, the history of World War II, it would seem like we'd be a lot more precise with World War II than would be with some elements of church history. Uh, he makes some points about like how the hagiographies of St. Constantine shift. Um, and it's not that like, oh, well, I, I'll take what Nicaea too says about St. Constantine's baptism before I take what, you know, Eusebius says about it. Eusebius right. is the same. Well, the problem is we have like St. Strom and Ambrose saying the same story that Eusebius gives, right. right? So we'd be pitting saints against saints, which we don't want to do. Um, and so there are certain shifting aspects in hagiography. Anyone who's read hagiography finds tropes like uh, virginal women. Um, they try to defile them. And then usually that's stopped by some miracle. Um, they often, if they're martyrs, they give up the soul before their martyrdom. Um, virginal women is a big thing within hagiographies. Uh, more than one hagiography records where a, an ascetic will help people robbing him steal his stuff. Um, so we, we see certain like, repeats it doesn't mean they can't happen that's not my point my right. point is though, like when you, if you were to look at this like you were referring to before with first and second bull run like we'll look at the rest of history it it appears legitimately more suspect right. especially when there appears to be these sort of i think the word is didactic like these didactic sort of tropes which are there on purpose right. um you know and, and so i well, could another see example of patterns that. you see in the lives of the saints if you look at the various virgin martyrs of women, they're almost always described as being extremely beautiful women. Well, you could say, well, that how, how likely is that? But on the other hand, what, what, consider this. If you're a pagan and you're looking for women that you would like to force to, to become a pagan so that you could use them in, in, a, in a sexual way, what kind of woman are you looking for? <laughs> so so the fact that that's a pattern doesn't mean that it's not a true pattern it just makes perfect sense that you know people who are looking with malicious intents are going to pay a lot more attention to beautiful christian women than they are to ones that are homely it was davidic propaganda that he was ruddy and handsome <laughs> <laughs> so that you know it's i think that it's because hagiographies in my opinion, are like the Reader's Digest of theology, right. just like the hymnography you are to sing. And so if there's a detail that doesn't precisely align, it's on purpose. And the idea is to teach theology. And right well, so the thing I see, think we should, we, we should also point out is that we don't consider every account of a life of the saint to be infallible. And, and so it's not like if you don't believe in the donation of Constantine because there's a, an account of it that you're, you're denying something that's infallibly true, uh, or that you, if you don't believe that St. Constantine was baptized in Rome. Uh, but there are aspects of Saint, saints' lives that have more authority than others. And so there are certain saints that are very prominent. And certainly when you look at what we say about them in the services, I think that we would have to say that they're true, at least in some sense. Yeah, now, it's like uh, we talked about uh, a couple of years ago, St. Denis the Areopagite, right? right? And he said, well, maybe they took things that he wrote and they added things to it, but the church has received it as being authentic and important, and that's what's important. Right. So it's if hagiographies have some sort of development, that that's not a scandal as a development in details, by the way, guys. We're not talking about theological developments. Right. The, it's the theology is what's important. And they are uh, iconiums. They're supposed to be praising the saints. It's, uh, it's like you're not going to get angry at someone giving a, uh, you know, words during a funeral saying great things about your uncle. And you go, well, I remember some random things about my uncle. Yeah. You know, <laughs> we, we tend to gloss over those things. And that's normal. Um, so... I think it's because we're so used to treating history in a materialistic way. We don't read Christian history. This includes the scriptures correctly. Now, like in the early church, for example, um, St. Irenaeus, but also Clement Alexander picks up on this. Uh, they talk about how the, the Bible was corrupted and St. Ezra reconstituted it. 
Now, this may make sense of, well, it looks like there's all these sources combined and whatnot, like the liberals came up with. Yeah. But the point is, it doesn't show they have no authority. Like our argument would be, well, if this was reconstituted, it was done through a profit and it was directed with a purpose, right? So it's, you could look at something materialistically and dismissively, or you could look at something like a Christian in a charitable way and see, well, what's the point of this? And presume that it's reliable. And then right. you don't have issues. Um, and so I think if we were consistent with that methodology, this is something we've been saying a lot, we'd have bigger issues which would have problems, would create problems for the scriptures. Um, he gave some uh, other interesting critiques like Cairo uh, Lucaris and his uh, canonization, which um, God forgive me, but I do kind of think that is a little problematic. Now we have two patriarchates that actually uh, have them in their uh, six scenario. And I don't think that will rule out, went out over time. It kind of goes back to the definition of ecumenical council. You can have one or two people with have the same veneration, but it's when all the patriarchates and all the synods accept the same is when we know absolutely that person's a saint. Well, and, and the rationale behind uh, glorifying him as a saint is the there is an, argu there's an argument to be made that his confession was a forgery or that it was altered. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, by Calvinist intrigue. And uh, I, I've heard very conservative Greek theologians make that case. I don't know whether that's true or not, but it doesn't really matter uh, that much. And like you said, a saint could be glorified in a local church. It doesn't necessarily mean that that's infallibly the, the judgment of the whole church. And, and there's more that we could get into. There's interesting details in the Council of Jerusalem, 1672, um, where then they quote other legitimate writings from Carl Lacaris, which show him, you know, disowning Protestant doctrine. So it, it's it's an interesting question and yeah. probably too complicated to get into at the moment. Um, I think he gives a critique of Toll Houses based on too literal of a reading. Um, right. So it's something, it's it's something he that. probably doesn't understand, and he also knows that most Protestants that maybe are just vaguely interested in Orthodoxy. That that's something that's going to sound really strange, but uh, but the but the key thing about the toll houses is a they're they're not intended to be taken overly literally. Nobody with any sense takes them in a, in a sense that there's literal gates that you pass through. But there is a spiritual reality uh, of demons confronting souls at the time of their death. And what's interesting, a while back you mentioned. Uh, Shoemaker, I can't remember his first name, uh, and, and he's not an Orthodox uh, patristic scholar, but he is a patristic scholar, and he wrote a review of the book on the Toll Houses that was published by St. Anthony Monastery, which is a huge compendium of all the evidence for the Toll Houses, and I guarantee you will never see a thorough refutation of that book. You will only see it being dismissed because it makes the case uh, in a in a in a way that goes beyond the shadow of a reasonable doubt. But what's interesting is after he makes this critique, well, the doctrine of the toll houses only originated late in the first millennium. Blah 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 blah. blah. But then at the end of his piece, he says, "But you know, when it, when it comes to the dispute over the soul by angels and demons, there's a lot of evidence for that." <laughs> Which is what it is. <laughs> and and the thing is, what are the toll houses? The toll houses are an image of that very phenomenon that you're saying that there's tons of evidence for. Um, we always use verbal images. You find them in scripture. You find them in the tradition of the church. They're not meant to be taken as the reality itself. It's an image of the reality. We, we don't have in our daily life experiences of demons and angels fighting over the soul. And so you have different images that are used in different texts in services of the, of the church, writings of the fathers that describe this phenomenon, but that the image is not the reality. It points to a reality. So, for example, in the life of St. Athanasius the Great, I mean, in the life of St. Anthony the Great, written by St. Athanasius the Great, one of the fathers that this guy wants to claim there's an account of St. Anthony seeing what was, you know, what is can only be described as the toll houses. It's just that they don't use that word. 
but it's basically the image that St. Anthony sees is of this big giant that's trying to capture souls as they're ascending to heaven. And, um, well, it's, it's not the Toll House image, but it's talking about the exact same thing. Um, and and there's some funny examples like that. Now, I want to show some of the scriptures. This is a scripture you brought up a, a few years ago. And it's Luke 12, 20, where it says, you know, you fool tonight, your soul will be required of you. And people read in English, and they don't think that much harder about it. But I want people to look at the Greek word, apa, apai, doisin. <laughs> um, and it's a verb, a third person plural. Tonight, your soul will be acquired from them, right, of you. They will you require know, your soul. They will require your soul. That's better. So, yeah. <laughs> so the point is, who are they <laughs> that are requiring right. your soul? It, and it, it's, it's, it's the Toll House Doctrine. It's the angels that come. It, it's usually translated in the passive way, tonight your soul will be required of you. But that's not what it says in Greek. <laughs> it, it, it is saying... They will require your soul of you. And interestingly, this is one of the reasons why I love the King James, is if you have a King James with the margin notes, the margin notes very often tell you things that most Protestant translations will not tell you. And the margin note there says, Greek, they will require your soul. And so the, who are they? That's, a, that's a, a good question for those against the toll houses. And, and, and Blessed Theophylact, his commentary, tells us who they are. And they're t talking about the fearsome angels, but he's clearly not talking about the good ones. <laughs> he's talking about the <laughs> demons. And he says that come on, on a soul that, uh, you know, that basically has something for them to, to uh, latch on to. Come on to him like a tax collector. Well, the toll houses... The imagery at the toll houses is of tax collectors. You know, the, the word toll house actually does occur in the New Testament. It's, 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 it's where we're, we're told about Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom is the way that it's translated in the King James, um, where people had to pay their taxes. So the fishermen, after they had a big catch, they had to pay taxes. St. Matthew was collecting them. Well, why, why is there this connection with tax collectors? Well, it's because in the ancient world, tax collectors were a scary thing because they were given very broad authority by the government to collect taxes. And they could do almost anything to you to collect it. And they very routinely collected more than they were really authorized by the law to collect. So basically, they could take everything you had and or throw you into prison. And... Uh, so the, the tax collectors were a very scary thing. And so to compare demons to that makes a lot of sense in that context. I mean, we don't like the IRS, but the IRS isn't quite as bad as those folks are, at least not usually. Now, a few other things in this rewriting history section. Um, he mentions how St. Gregory Palamas, he takes issue with uh, they took us being called the border between created and uncreated. And again, as I mentioned before, it just shows that Iconium um, does not um, translate well, right? Especially not in the society, right? It's used the borders being created and uncreated, not because she is uncreated, it's because the uncreated was in her. Right. Right. Her her womb is that borderline. It's it yeah, seems she, pretty obvious. Um, she she's the means by which the uncreated became a human being. So that's why she's at the border. But again, it's just because it's never spoken about this way in Protestantism, it just sounds wrong, right? It's just like when we call our mother a god, it just sounds bad. Informed, and again, bad to Protestants. Um, informed Protestant apologists like R.C. Sproul were totally fine with the term Theotokos. Yeah, he, 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 there's, a, there's an episode of his uh, Renewing Your Mind that yeah. he, he spent the entire show defending the idea that the Virgin Mary was the mother of God. On the other hand, there was an older systematic theology that used to be the standard in the church of Nazarene before I went to school. So it was already no longer the text we used in our systematic theology, but it was by H. Orton Wiley. And I got a copy of it. It was a three volume set because I, I wanted to see what the old timey Nazarenes thought about stuff. But I remember when he was talking about the ecumenical councils, he said, well, we accept the ecumenical councils, except we would prefer the title Christotokos to Theotokos. And I'm thinking, okay, 
you clearly don't accept the third ecumenical council because that's what the whole council was about. <laughs> but he but he affirmed he accepted the seven ecumenical councils while denying, in the clearest sense, at least one of them. It's that's something where I think happens a lot. They'll say we affirm this or that doctrine. Yeah. All right, like with icons, you ask about that doctrine from a perspective right. they don't accept it. All of a sudden, they don't. And it's be, it's kind of an ad hoc tradition. There's this claim made in the beginning of the film. Oh, well, the Protestant reformers were, they were totally consistent with all the early fathers and they strive to be. And I'd say, not really. I mean, you know, Calvin admitted that, oh yeah, relics were all over the place, but they were wrong, right? Like they ultimately were not submitting to the consensus, the saints on right. question. Um, and again, if you believe in Sola Scriptura, that can be justifiable. It's just that this rejection of relics, I think, doesn't actually follow from uh, Sola Scriptura when there's actually relics in the scriptures, like, you know, uh, uh, articles St. Paul's clothing that are used to heal and stuff like that. So we do, it's just you don't, you don't have this. And, the, and of, call, of course, the bones yeah. of Elisha. Um, yep. Just a couple of quibbles. Uh, the video makes a claim that uh, Pope Galatius did not condemn all the apostolic canons. Uh, maybe that would be something more important to a Roman Catholic where Pope says goes. Galatius isn't a saint for us. Right. But I would point out that they he would have accepted the first 50 apostolic canons. They didn't accept up to the next 35 apostolic canons. That's what the debate was over, was off on the additional 35 right. apostolic canons. That, that's in all Western canon law, by the way. So this right. just a little technical quibble. Um, I'd like to add that the sort of apologetic that the differences in Protestantism are less crucial than the ones in Orthodoxy, I just can't get down with that. I mean, like with Protestants, like the important stuff is irrelevant. Like the age you baptize someone, who gets communed, you know, the gender of who could serve doing what, like that's kind of less important. But like whether the bread and wine is actually Christ's flesh and blood, you know, um, you know, the, those things that which are important for us, they, it, they're not important to them. And so they lack a division on non-essentials, and they think that's them having more unity. When we are divisive over really important stuff, and they're like, well, that means they have more division than the Protestants. So I just think it's, it, it just shows the perspective. There's, there's this real danger that in we're so used to Protestants, for example, rejecting head coverings for women, where it's flat out in the Bible, right? Flat out in the Bible, but because and prior to 1950, almost none of them did. Yeah, but it's I, I, defy, I defy anybody to show me any pictures uh, of Protestant worship services prior to the 1950s where you have women with uncovered heads. And so they'll lay this claim to like Sola Scriptura, like they actually consistently follow through with this. And then when you point out, go, wait a second, well, how about this head covering? Oh, well, you're reading it wrong. And you do, you put the Greek upside down and mean something different. And everyone for 1900 years was wrong about it, you know? And it's like, it doesn't sound very compelling. There's, they're just so used to taking their own traditions, like, you know, uh, what Christ says is his flesh and blood in plain text in, in John chapter six and say, it's not his flesh and blood and, and things like that, where they're just so used to doing it, they consider it le their traditions legitimate. And so when they see Orthodox doing, let's just call it how they would see an interpretive stretch, it totally delegitimate, delegitimizes it, even though all the saints have the same interpretive stretch on a given question, or most of them. People don't like the word all. Right. Um, and so I just think there's a lot of stuff that I think is kind of this ethnic bias where they look past their own divisions. They look past their own view of what is important and what's not essential. They look past their own obvious ignoring of parts of the scriptures. They don't do confession, for example, which is in James chapter five. They don't heal with oil, which is in James chapter five. They, they ignore these things, but it, that's fine. And, they're, and apparently they're not essential. They're not important to di divide enough over. Well, let's, let's consider a few of the things that are not essential differences between Protestants. You have the Calvinists that say that from all eternity, God decided everybody who would ever be saved 
arb- that having nothing to do with anything they would choose to do and that everybody else is going to be damned to hell for all eternity. And then you have Armenians that say, none of that is true. The gospel is open to everybody. Anyone who goes to hell goes to hell because they rejected the gospel, but they could have chosen it. That's not an essential difference. It sounds like you've got two different gods there to me. Um, and also, if you're going to go outside the, re- the bounds of conservative evangelicalism, because in his video, for example, he, he shows um, Archbishop Elpa de Forest, our favorite archbishop of uh, the Greek archdiocese, who uh, you know, has done some contra- controversial, controversial stuff. He says, if you're looking for a, uh, a, a pro-gay uh, bishop, you've got him. But if you want one that opposes it, you've got that too. So basically, he's acting as if those are just two uh, acceptable choices with an orthodoxy. Well, number one, Archbishop Elba de Forest has done he some censured. stuff. He, 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 he's, been, <laughs> he's, he's been censured, but the thing is, even he usually tries to keep plausible deniability or maybe a little bit implausible deniability, but he, doesn't, he goes only so far with what he says. There are Presbyterian churches that have lesbian trannies uh, serving as clergy. You know, so, so I'm sure that he would say, well, yeah, but they're a bunch of heretics. They don't count. Okay, so you get to pick and choose which Protestants count and which ones don't. Um, so so uh, you, 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 if you say the only true Protestants are the Protestants that I consider to be true Protestants because I agree with them, then you can say, well, all true Protestants agree with me. Well, that's, that's kind of a circular argument there. At least, at least we could actually legitimately say – at any given time, not all the Orthodox Church is going to be right about every single issue. Right. But right. we can look at our synods and our saints and say, yes, you know, they're correct. Right. And they're going to be reliable when looked at a consensus, which doesn't mean absolutely every single one, but the vast preponderance. That That right. is our standard. Right. Um, but again, it's like, I think we need to be somewhat forgiving of the critique given simply because it's just so normal to the Protestant to think this way. This is... It's, it's right. just so common. And so we just want to challenge people to, to think a little harder and more critically about it and realize the critique sounds good until you start looking at how consistently it's applied and what is supposedly negotiable and not negotiable from a Protestant perspective and even a Presbyterian, right? Like, oh, there's so many Protestants. Well, how about Presbyterians? And you, you get all the same issues, if not actually dramatically more profound issues. Um, Father, let me give you an opportunity for some overall or some last words on topic. If we have any sort of questions, uh, we'll address a few. Um, so, Father, how about you take some time to give some overall thoughts? Well, what I hope happens is that people who see this video are willing to dig a little bit deeper. It's a great work of propaganda because it's, it take, it's selective in terms of what it presents as orthodoxy and basically sets up straw men so that it can knock it down. I hope our video helps in terms of providing people with the answers. But, uh, but you know, I, I have no way of knowing if this guy really just hasn't understood orthodoxy or whether he's really dug into it and he's intentionally trying to distort it because he knows by distorting it's an effective way to uh, convince people to, to stay away from it. But in any case... It's just not an accurate representative a representation of what the Orthodox Church is. And um, one thing that I would encourage Protestants to do is to read the epistles of St. Ignatius of Antioch. You, you want early evidence of Orthodoxy? I'll tell you, when I was, when I was a Protestant, studying to be a Protestant minister, and I read the epistles of St. Ignatius of Antioch, when I was done, I knew I could not stay a Protestant. I wasn't sure what I was going to do, uh, but I, I could, knew I could not stay a Protestant because it's obvious when you read the epistles of St. Ignatius of Antioch that he was not a Protestant. He certainly wasn't a Presbyterian because he talks an awful lot about bishops, and Presbyterians have a problem with bishops as being a rank above presbyters. Uh, but... He very clearly believed that the Eucharist was truly the body and blood of Christ, and he very he very clearly believed that no church that has doesn't that does that does not have bishops, priests, and deacons can be called a real church. 
And he also believed that there could only be one church that's in communion with the with each with itself, and uh, that schism is a sin. He said that um, those who follow no, those are going to schism. Yeah, make no mistake, brother. No one who follows another into a schism will inherit the kingdom of God. No one who follows heretical doctrines is on the side of the passion. Well, if you're if you're an Orthodox Presbyterian, do you even have a concept of schism? Because the Orthodox Presbyterians are a schism of a schism of a schism. Uh, and, uh, and probably a couple other schisms that I'm not thinking about offhand. I mean, it, there's just so many schisms that it's, it's not even funny. And uh, it, to be, to, for a Protestant, if I, wanted, if I was a Protestant and I wanted to go start another church tomorrow, I could do it. And as long as I affirm the doctrine of the Trinity and that you know, Christ was truly God, truly man and all that, and I believe the Bible, uh, and uh, you know, believed in at least some of the solas. I would have to be accepted by other Protestants as being a legit church. So you can't even commit the sin of schism in the in the Protestant church because it's just there's too many schisms that have gotten us to where we're at. Which uh, and that and that demands the question: How could something be legitimate where a sin becomes not sin anymore? Right. There's no objective basis. It, 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 it's the normalization of sin. And Christ himself, when he talked about how do you resolve problems in the church, he said, well, first you talk to the person one-on-one. -on -one. If that doesn't work, then you take two or three witnesses, uh, and then uh, you talk to them. But if that doesn't work, then you take it to the church. Doesn't say take it to the church of your choice. Uh, he says, take it to the church. And if you hear not the church, let him be unto you as a heathen and a publican. Well, you can't take it to the church when you have thousands of Protestant denominations. If I have ought against my brother and I'm a Presbyterian and he's a Pentecostal, we don't have a church to take it to. So, so we can't do what Christ said to do because we're, we, we, have, we have totally different ideas of what the church is. Uh, so the, the whole Protestant approach to what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be in the church, just doesn't work in the light of what Christ himself talked about, but certainly in the light of what uh, St. Ignatius of Antioch, a disciple of the Apostle John, and a bishop of Antioch, the most important center of Christianity at the time, whom he had and he had been entrusted to be the bishop of this most important see by the apostle john so if you assume as i would that the apostle john had enough sense to pick someone who was trustworthy and that actually understood the faith you'd have to assume that the apostle john thought this guy knew what he was talking about and so you can't can't dismiss him as a later accretion you you, you kind of have to deal with what he says and there's no way no way that you can come out of Presbyterian, <laughs> Orthodox or otherwise, and read the Epistles of St. Ignatius of Antioch and take them seriously. Or, or St. Clement, for that matter, because they actually threaten the schismatics there with damnation for choosing their own presbyters. So it's, right, uh, and, the, and these are undeniably as early as you get outside yep. of the New Testament. Clem as Clement of St. Paul. He's in Philippians chapter 4. Both the Epistles of St. Ignatius and the Epistle of Clement were included in some uh, copies of the of the Bible, the Canon, yeah, and, and so uh, the church could have said that they were part of the New Testament. It just so happens that they made a more narrow canon because they were dealing with crazy heretics like Marcion, and they didn't want uh, people to be confused about what Scripture was. Uh, but uh, but obviously yeah, the, the, these texts were the highly other, valued. Paul? But he, he speaks of like there's essentially a New Testament Deutero canon, and like in Clement right. could be part of it. It's not. Right. Even with our canons, um, Apostolic Canon 85 actually allows the first Clement to be canon. So it's uh, some, some truth to it. Right. The, um, and uh, at least, though, I could say from a filmmaker's perspective, at least the Orthodox Presbyterian Church may have a more exclusive view and they might be a little more like stringent with some of these things and this overall Protestant critique when it comes to church discipline. I'm not sure. That's something the filmmaker could respond to more specifically. It's somewhat pretty... Words in his mouth because I really just don't know enough about the OPC. The well, if, if he thinks the vast majority of Protestants are a bunch of heretics that don't qualify as real Protestants, he probably ought to say that. I have a feeling that's probably what he really believes, but 
you know, he, he, he ought to yeah, clarify that would be what interesting, he means. Right? Like it said, we have less division, but the official stance of his church is no, they're like the PCA is illegitimate <laughs> or something like that. Um, then, you yeah, know, that'd be, that'd be interesting. Um, hopefully that's something we could talk more about um, uh, together. Um, we'll see if, uh, if Pastor James Wallace could, could confirm that or not. Uh, I, like I said, my experience is in the PCA. Right. Uh, before we do any questions, I just want to point people to, uh, if this has blessed you, um, please go to orthodoxchristiantheology.com slash donate. The link is below. It's also scrolling below. It helps support the church in Cambodia. Um, in fact, that's uh, what this plaque is from. You know, their, their gratitude for the support of this uh, show and all that. Thank you to donors like you. So thank you so much. Please keep supporting the church in Cambodia. In fact, uh, I just moved, which explains the different backgrounds, and uh, spent sixty dollars to make sure this show would happen today. So, if some anonymous donor wants to match that sixty dollars, I'd be very grateful <laughs> for helping make this show happen on time. Um, Father John, could you give any plugs so people could follow you, help support you? Well, you can go to my parish website, Saint spelled out Jonah.org. And there's links to my articles there, as well as links to my blog. My blog is on blogs, Blogspot. It's uh, father spelled out, john.blogspot.com. My sermons posted on Ancient Faith Radio, as well as my website. And I finally started doing those videos that I've been telling you about for a couple oh, yes. of years now. I finally started doing them. We're talking about how to do reader services. I've got four done so far. Are, is there a channel, or you're, or you're recording like a library? I'm posting it on the St. Jonah uh, YouTube channel. Oh, okay. Partly so because I want to drive Jonah up YouTube the channel. subscriber uh, numbers for St. Jonah because uh, I think we have to get up to 1,000 before we'd be able to use uh, a mobile device to, to broadcast live. And like today, for example, we broadcasted our liturgy, and for some reason, the audio wasn't coming through. Someone tell, told me in the middle of the service, hey, uh, someone told us the audio is not coming through. Well, I'm, I didn't have any ability to deal with it. But if we could have live casted on a on a cell phone, I would have said, well, just end that stream and let's just do it with the with, with a cell phone. At least people would have been able to hear what was going on. So but but anyway, so so four videos so far and I'm, I'm going to. Uh, try to cover how to do reader services as thoroughly as I, I feel like I need to. And uh, then maybe I might do some other stuff too. So guys, stop everything you're doing now and subscribe, go to YouTube, St. Jonah and put Texas. I'm sure that's in there somewhere and subscribe to the channel. Let's get father John to a thousand. He deserves it. That's right. That's right. right. <laughs> it up. So we'll do a few questions. Um, we got this here. What do you say of some Catholic scholars which say that the papal claims to supremacy are more or less innovations during the 11th century and are unfounded during the first millennium of the church? Um, that we agree with them, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, and because of, uh, oh, what was that uh, English uh, cardinal, Cardinal Newman, that came up with the idea of doctrinal development for Roman Catholic apologists now, they don't even bat an eye. They'll just say, yeah, well, it was doctrinal development. You know, it's okay. You it's, it's okay that the Fifth Ecumenical Council was held over the objections of the Pope while the Pope was in Constantinople. The only time that a Pope actually was physically present and could have presided over an ecumenical council, he refused to do it. He didn't want the council to meet. The council went ahead and met anyway. And at the end of their council, they said, you know what, Pope, if you don't uh, accept what we decided, we're going to depose you. And you know what the, the, the Pope decided to do? He decided to <laughs> accept the decrees of the council. And Roman Catholics believe that to be an infallible council. Well, you know what? You don't get papal supremacy out of that. You don't get, uh, you don't get universal jurisdiction out of that. There's no way to square that circle. No way. We have this. Do I of you actually know about the work of Dr. Paul? I'm going to pronounce it wrong. I'm sorry. Gavrilik and his organization, International Orthodox Theology Association, or IOTA. The answer is I actually do because I almost presented in Volos, uh, but in January, but they lifted the uh, 
the mystery disease uh, restrictions in Cambodia. And so I only had one, I could only do one international trip a year uh, with the family. And I chose uh, Cambodia to help support the churches there over presenting um, a paper of mine, which I was actually scheduled to present as IOTA. Um, the organization is uh, more standard mainline academic, which means there'd be stuff with social issues and whatnot, which are that are definitely liberal. I also know that uh, there is stuff with the Ukraine-Russia conflict where some of the participants have uh, very strong opinions about it. Um, but yes, it's, uh, it's, it's an academic uh, organization and it's an organization that would, uh, in many respects, not align with traditional views. Um, but that doesn't mean that someone with good academic credentials or bad academic credentials, like myself, right? I'm not much of an academic, could present something that is a serious issue. So that's uh, that's something, like, like I said, I, I, you could actually go to the website and find what paper I was gonna present in the day I was supposed to do it. I just couldn't make it. Right. There, there's some good stuff that they've come out with, but there's some pretty crazy crap that they've come out with too. Most recently, Father John Gillians gave a presentation about how we know the will of God and uh, ended the, the, his, his talk by quoting from uh, the, the, you know, St. Maria of Skopsova, you know, who was the, uh, the Parisian uh, uh None who was like twice divorced, cigar smoking, and uh, a surgeon, not a surgeonist, a a sophianist, <laughs> uh, admirer of uh, uh, Father Sergei Bulgakov, and uh, the, the ecumenical patriarch uh, glorified her because she she died in a concentration camp, and according to the account, she did so she chose to sacrifice herself to save other people, which is certainly noble. But even if we recognize that she's a saint, it doesn't mean that she's that everything that she ever said was true. But he ends it by quoting her as saying, if every tradition and all the wisdom of the ages tells me that something is wrong, but what I believe Christ would do tells me that I should do it then I'll blow off all the traditions of the ages and all the, all the, all the wisdom that's ever been been known in the church. Well, I can tell you why father John Gillian's quoted that. And that's because he's got some children who, from what I've heard are are on the rainbow spectrum. And, uh, and he wants to say, even though the tradition clearly says that that's a sin, Christ wouldn't, you know, say that these people can't be communicants in the church. And so I'm going to blow off, what the scriptures and the traditions say and accept that. Uh, so yeah, that's a problem. I did like, uh, my family just returned. So we'll take a while. one more question before it gets too noisy here. And I want to just thank, I won't say the donor's name aloud. So you'll have his reward in heaven, but someone already donated the $60. God bless you. Hot dog. <laughs> so that was, that was nice and fast. We have this question. Um, do you believe that, or uh, that Patriarch Bartholomew will push for unification 2025? with the Pope, um, why are so many ecumenists calling for unification? Um, I think there'll be a serious push. Uh, and as I covered in my show with Father Peter, it will look actually like a capitulation from the Roman Catholic side, is my prediction. It That's already be. the groundwork that they're laying, is they're making it look like Rome is conceding all the points. Um, the thing is, Rome doesn't care about anything other than you submitting to the Pope at the end of the day. That's what that's how they can have Nestorians and Monophysites that become Uniates and don't change anything they believe other than they acknowledge the authority of the Pope. So, yeah, I think that's where it's going. I think ultimately whether union happens or not will be determined by the U.S. State Department. So that being said... That being I, said, I think it's likely to happen. I hope that I'm wrong. But if I was going to bet money on the question, I would bet that it's going to happen. It's it's a, it's a sad thing. May uh, may God have mercy on us and help us. Um, yep. So, Father John, it's been so great to collaborate with this issue. I think we gave a very um, detailed response to the film that was uh, respectful but yet entertaining. And uh, it's only something I think I could do with you. So I'm very grateful. Well, thank you for having me on. And I think we, we put in more uh, time than that video. So we've got him beat on that score for sure. There you go. <laughs> I'm sure it's helped him more time, though, to make his than for us yeah. to do this. 
<laughs> but it's uh, so, guys, uh, stay tuned. Um, God willing, we'll be having Father Peter on uh, next week on his new book. And we'll be, uh, God willing, also having Pastor James Wallace uh, on an interview on this film. So we'll follow up with that. And uh, guys, as I end all the shows, I will end this one by quoting Jesus Rock. Fight to death for the truth. And the Lord God will fight for you. God bless you. Have a great day.